Okay, folks, we're going to get started. Here we go, everybody. I want to welcome, this is the Elected Officials Transportation Committee. It's Thursday, June 20th, and this is our quarterly meeting. Uh, welcome, welcome to all the new members. Welcome to all the old remember, members. old members. Or so. <laughs> this one feels really old. Um, uh, and I think we're just gonna we're going. I just pulled an all nighter. It's true. We're gonna we're gonna go ahead right into public comment. Do we have any public comment today? Is there anybody here who'd like to get up and say something? Speak now or um, okay. It doesn't seem like we have public comment. Uh, if I may. Oh, um, please. I do have one letter from uh, Tony Kronberg. Um, I don't know if it's specific to one item on the agenda. I don't know if you'd like me to enter it now or if you'd like to wait until we get Why to Why don't that. we wait till it's with the proper okay. time of the agenda, then you've got a copy you can enter into the record okay. with whomever does that. Sounds Maybe good. it's you. He does. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and then so item number two is, uh, actually, we're going to move that down, right? I know I, we have a change because Stephanie Zaza is not here. Right. So we're going to move that down. We're going to go to item number three right off the bat because I think you've got there are other people here. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, so this is the Brush Creek Park and Ride Flap Improvements. And uh, take it away, David. I'll give it to you. All right, well, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, before we get into the, the first item, I'd just like to go through a, a few uh, reminders about the EOTC. Uh, the first is about the enabling legislation and ballot requirements uh, that the uh, the purpose for the EOTC is to finance, construct, operate, and manage mass transportation systems within the Roaring Fork Valley. Uh, we do have a mission statement, and that mission statement is to work collectively to reduce and or manage the volume of vehicles on the road system and continue <coughs> to develop and support a comprehensive multimodal long-range strategy that will ensure a convenient and efficient transportation system for the Roaring Fork Valley. And we do have an IGA in place, um, and that is has a number of things in it, um, but it does um, engage the EOTC to implement uh, the Comprehensive Valley Transportation Plan, which does include separated dedicated transit way between Aspen and Snowmass and Aspen um, in the airport, as well as the operation of park and ride lots at Brush Creek Airport and or Buttermilk. Um, and some operational uh, reminders that this is a recommending body only um, for the expenditure of the half cent transit sales and use tax. Uh, and that each jurisdiction uh, must vote with 51 plus uh, percent for the recommendation to progress, uh, and that only budget items uh, must be approved with a quorum by the member jurisdictions. And that's so it. So thank you. That's that's something we should probably read at the beginning of every quarterly meeting. It's it's like the the articles of war that the captain reads on the deck of the ship, right? <laughs> so you know, exactly. to get everybody in line as we as we move we'll forward. Rocking the boat on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's supposed to be motivational. Um, so looking at the, the items uh, that we do have on the agenda, um, Greg, uh, the chairman, uh, discussed moving the first item down to number three. Um, we had that one first, just so you know. Um, <coughs> Stephanie Zaza, the facilitator, was supposed to be here. She had a death in the family and had to leave unexpectedly. Um, so as a result of that, move that one back um, and try to get some of these other folks out of here uh, who are here um, for other items a little bit sooner. Uh, so move right into uh, the Brush Creek uh, Park and Ride Flap Grant after this. Um, and then into the dynamic message sign, since those are our two action items. Uh, then we'll discuss the EOTC retreat, uh, the Snowmass Village Transit Center uh, with David Peckler, um, and the RAFTA retreat and ballot measure 7A update with David Johnson from RAFTA. So we'll come back to those slides. Um, so the FLAP grant, uh, a little bit of a background on the current status. Uh, we are currently at 30% plans. Uh, we have done some um, outreach, so we've done local meetings, uh, if you'll recall, with the surrounding um, property owners. That was done in January and February. Uh, we did have an open house at CMC in April, and we had a public opinion survey that was conducted for several weeks in May. Currently, the timeline, um, we're moving uh, into final plans. Uh, and the Picking County well septic permitting and engineering is expected to be completed in 2020. Uh, we are planning on coming back to you in the spring of 2020 um, with 70% plans. So this meeting here tonight um, is to uh, make sure that we're all moving forward in the direction that you'd like, this, like to see this going um, as we move into those 70% uh, those plans. Uh, construction is planned for 2021. 
Uh, and just a reminder on the project scope, uh, the, this is a FLAP grant, so Federal Highways Administration, um, Federal Lands Access Program grant. They are very competitive. Um, we are very lucky to have gotten this grant. Uh, but the scope is limited to restrooms, paving, well, and septic, um, as well as um, accessory lighting um, and landscaping. Uh, the current estimates for the project uh, are currently at $4.2 million. million. Um, we, over the last couple of days, we have met with uh, the Federal Highways Administration uh, as well as uh, the consulting engineer who are both here. Um, it'll be able to answer your questions as I, as I go through this uh, this evening. Um, it appears that we're right at about that, um, that estimate right now at about $4.2 million uh, with what I'm um, we'll go through here uh, this afternoon. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, there are some options here um, that could re require additional EOTC funding. Um, we'll have a more um, exact estimate come next spring um, based on the feedback that we receive here um, and once we get farther into the design. Uh, some of the, the items uh, that we'll be going through, they're considered action items. Like I said, we are um, looking for basically confirmation that the direction that staff is providing to um, the consulting engineers is correct and is in conformance with the direction you'd like us to go. Um, with that, I'd like to invite John Knowles up uh, to give you a little update uh, or background on the Federal Highways FLAP program um, and where we are in that, progress, uh, in that process. Uh, Welcome. You know, Come on up. Guys. Uh, my role and my title with the uh, Central Federal Lands of, uh, Division of the Federal Highway Administration is I'm a project manager. <clears throat> and my job is once these projects are programmed to deliver the project. So we either deliver the project internally or externally. We develop the design. We also uh, do the actual construction. We'll hire a, uh, a contractor and we uh, administer that contract. So uh, you guys applied for and received uh, money from the Federal Lands Access Program. And so uh, every so often, every several years, we do a call for projects and people apply for them. And it's a competitive <coughs> Uh, process based on merit and also match and in the state of Colorado the minimum match is 17 percent and on this project we're overmatched and there are some things that we're doing that aren't typically eligible for those funds but since you're overmatched it's it's a part of the project um, let's see uh, uh, right now we have a, a call that I think ended uh, I think it was the first part of June or the end of May for a call, the next round for the call of projects. And we're kind of going through the process of selecting projects for the, for the upcoming years. So right now, um, the FLAT program is contributing $2.2 million for this project. And the EOTC is committing $2 million to the project. So that's where we're coming up with the, with the $4.2 million. And like David said, we're a little bit over budget right now, but that's fairly typical <laughs> with projects. And then we, as we try to refine the scope and try to you know, match the, the program amount with the project, I'm hoping that some of that will come down, or we'll just have to come up with more money. So. Um, Oh, great, thank you. So that's kind of where we're at right now. As David said, it's a 2021 project, um, and and that's when we plan to obligate the funds for the project, and also um, uh, start the construction project. So, if you, that's kind of all I had. If you have any questions, questions about comments? the program, about the process, clarification. Marky. So you will hire the builder. Yeah, we okay. will we will go out for a contract. Okay. Yeah, we'll go out for a bid. We'll select the contractor. Okay. How what? <coughs> how long does that process take? Uh, well, um, usually it takes about two two and a half months. Oh, okay. So we'll advertise so for a month. We we'll receive bids. Then we have to review the bids and make sure uh -huh. uh, 
bonding's available for the low bidder, and then at that point we'll award the contract, and then we can start construction. Okay, sure. John, you you had mentioned um, you had mentioned that uh, at the point we would have to get more money, meaning right. the flap or the OTC. Well, right now there's 2.2 .2 million. <laughs> 1.5 coming through. Right now, there's 2.2 million available in flat. So that's all we have at this point. So it would either have to come from you guys or okay. some other sources at this point. John, this is Commissioner Curry. Just come in from another Hi, meeting. Commissioner. Hi, Commissioner. Welcome. Sorry, Glad you're here. Wait. No, no problem. Thank you. Other questions, com comments from the thanks for your Steve? Assistance. Um, the one. There was a discretionary item whether to do the covered mm -hmm. thing on the special mm -hmm. events mm -hmm. area or not. And I take it looking at the, this take on the budget initially is would, that would be off the table unless we're willing to come up with more money for that in the meantime. Yeah, and we'll discuss that here um, more in a few minutes. <coughs> uh, but there are, like I said, there are a few items on there that you probably noticed in the packet that that have um, budget items with them. One is the covered or partially enclosed. Um, at this point, it appears that where we are in the budget, that all of that would need to come from the EOTC or some other source uh, in order to cover that. And that's why I bring this up, so that as we do go through this, have that in mind, that that's, that's where we're looking financially right now. Great, all right. Why don't we keep going and questions will come up. All right. Well, before I get into the, the details. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, details of the, the plan itself, I did want to touch a little bit about the, touch on the survey just a little bit. Um, this, so this went out in May. Uh, it was open for about three weeks. We got 80 responses, um, which as it moved, for, as it moved uh, out to the public pretty quickly, I think was pretty good. Uh, the breakdown was about 31% Aspen, 31% Carbondale, 11% Elgebel, 7% Snowmass, and 6% Glenwood Springs. So uh, the benefit to the survey as opposed to um, some of the other outreaches, we were able to capture some people who use the facility but aren't necessarily uh, within the immediate um, convenient vicinity to where we were holding other meetings. Um, one thing that did stand out from the survey is we did have 45% of the lot, uh, or lot users being, saying that they were occasional. Uh, this is important because these are people who are aware of the lot, who know what it could be, um, and who we might be able to transition to being more regular users. So as opposed to someone who marks on here, I'm never going to use it, you, those are hard people to capture. Um, so that val validated a lot of the responses to, on my, or to me uh, that came in in terms of uh, the most noted issues and the top ways that we could increase use, because these were the people saying that this is these are my concerns at that at that location. So that these are listed in order. The top noted issue was safety, followed by lack of desired bus connections, lack of restrooms, and disorganized dirty, and then people camping. And the people camping kind of goes back to the safety piece. Um, and then top ways to increase use was the advanced warning um, of congestion, full time or full parking in Aspen or Snow Mass, which as you all know, we've been discussing with the dynamic message sign. Um, as well, followed up closely by permanent flush toilets, which is in the flap grant, um, increased security, paved parking, um, and the ki carpool kiosk actually we threw in there not expecting anybody would honestly choose it because it's kind of an odd thing to choose on, <laughs> on a survey, uh, but it did, did actually score um, higher than we suspect. Uh, suspected. Hey, David, could we yeah. go back? I, you, I don't know if you skipped it or I missed it. Light pollution, light. I know that's a big concern. Yeah, nice it is. One yeah. So the yeah the top concern. Yeah, there's an actual here. This one from. Okay, sorry, I'm looking at my note list. Um, was <laughs> was the light pollution, and that that came up both at the surrounding property owners meetings, um, at the public open house, and in the survey. That consistently came up as the number one. Um, concern that people had with this project. I think one and of the questions on that I uh, just wanted to put out there was that, uh, you know, would any new lighting be any different from the lighting that's there, or are the requirements different uh, for, you know, in order to get the flap, are things going to change, or is it the same sort of lighting? What do we have to expect? I'm not sure you're ready to answer that, but. Right. Uh, right now, uh, we're not to the point now, we're looking at the, having those specs at 70 percent, so we'd have those to you by next spring. Um, at this point, we've noted it as a significant issue. Um, Picking County does have requirements for dark sky lighting, so we have the minimum that it'll be dark sky, fully shielded, downward facing. Um, 
but we don't have placements or cut sheets, uh, so we don't have it to that level of detail. Um, since the lighting was put in. Another question um, while you're on the. Kelly? Yeah. When you're done with lighting. I okay, okay, sorry. Question. Turn your mic on. Um, since, since the lighting that's out there was put in, there has been some new technology um, in terms of the, the coloring that's available with LED lighting, um, as well as. Um, uh, like motion sensors or timers and dimming. So there's there's a lot of other options out there um, that weren't available at that time. Uh, so we do expect that the lighting will get better, um, even though there it could be potentially covering a larger area. Is, it, is the coloration, are you suggesting like a warmer temperature is just less obtrusive? Is that the deal? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it tends to have less of an impact on the dark, on the night sky. Got it. Okay, Kelly, no? Thanks. Um, with regards to the safety concerns, was there any way to distinguish concerns about personal safety versus safety of property? Uh, only through the written comments. Um, so they, it wasn't a choice in the drop-down list that we had. Um, <clears throat> judging by the written comments, it wasn't something the property concern wasn't, didn't rise okay. to, to an issue that people wrote in. Um, personal safety did. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that goes back to things that we can have the opportunity to address now with, with lighting um, and, as we'll dis discuss later, security cameras and, and call boxes. And no camping. And enforcing, trying to rein in the camping as much as possible, yes. Tori? Do you have records of incidences? We're talking about safety and it's a concern. How valid is the concern? I didn't go back and pull records from the sheriff's office, if that's what you're getting at. Kind of. To compare. Um, so my, my focus here was what is the impression of people's um, use of the lot? Because in a way, um, to me, that's almost more, like, people's impression of it is almost more important than the reality um, of whether they will get actually harassed. Uh, but whether they feel safe um, will dictate whether they use the lot or not. You know, except for the fact that if, if there's evidence that is there is not much incident and that it is safe, we would probably want people to know that. We would, yeah. Yeah. Rachel? Yeah. Uh, just can you hand me that a little bit more? The just point it at her. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to get my hands. I have a cold on anything. Um, I, I kind of following up on that. I I don't know if there's any way to do some cross referencing in the survey that was done. But it would be interesting to see that if people who marked, no, I never use the lot, and safety would be a top concern, mm -hmm. uh, is that why? Because, again, it goes back to the impressions. But just kind of see who or how safety was checked. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You can share mine okay. if you'd like. It's clean. <laughs> so just to move on to some of our takeaways, um, we, were, we were utilizing the survey to see our – do people generally feel like we're on the right track here? Are we identifying the right things to try to increase use? Um, and it appears that we, we are, we're hitting a lot of them. Um, if not with the FLAP project, um, then we're hitting it with other projects, or it's something that we can continue to work on. <coughs> so things like increased bus connections um, aren't part of anything that's uh, ongoing right now, but RAFTA is continuing mm -hmm. to work on that. Mm -hmm. um, and it raised increased um, sensitivity to us in terms of lighting and making sure that we get that right. Uh, as we move into 70% plans. Mm -hmm. Is there any more questions on the survey? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, just, just a question, did, did bicycle connectivity come up? Has that, has that popped into the discussion oh, yeah. in, it did. on the survey? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's um, on there. I want to bring it in. Okay. Yeah, that came up in a number of different areas. And again, that's, that's a project that the uh, City of Aspen um, and Pitkin County have been working on in terms of connectivity to the Rio Grande Trail, uh, but is outside the scope of this project in particular. Did I see another hand up over here? No. All right. Let's move on. All right. So in terms of um, areas where we're looking for confirmation um, tonight uh, and or action, uh, the first is the reallocation of $70,000 of FLAP grant uh, matching funds from 2020 to 2019. Uh, and then the rest are design review items. Uh, so this is um, the special events information booth, um, the snow melt, uh, solar panels, building sustainability, and security. Uh, so these are the ones that staff has identified as we, we want to make sure that we're going in the right directions in these areas. Um, and you're comfortable with the, with the direction we're going. Because as we send the consultants out to do this work, they're going down the wrong direction. We're essentially wasting money that we could spend doing um, something useful at the lot. Um, 
I identified it here as, as confirmation. So the staff recommendation is the direction that we have been going. Um, so again, we're looking to make sure that we're, we're continuing that if that's, if that's appropriate. Uh, but we do need official action on the re reallocation of the $70,000. Um, I'll get, um, go into that here in a second. As I go through the slideshow with the, um, with the site plan, uh, just so you know, I do have asterisks next to the slides that do require um, some sort of action, or we're asking for some sort of action from you. Um, if it doesn't have that, then it's, we're letting you know, but still feel free to chime in if, if there is something out there that we haven't hit on. Uh, so the FLAP grant, um, again, this is an action item. Uh, so as a reminder, this is a $4.2 million project. Uh, $1.9 million uh, is allocated as match um, from the EOTC. Uh, Federal Highways Administration is uh, administering the grant, uh, as John went over. Um, we do, as we've gotten farther into this, we now understand that the FLAP program will be invoicing us in 2019, uh, this summer and this fall, um, to about $70,000, which is the reason we're looking to move that from 2020 to 2019 so that we can fill those, uh, fulfill those invoice requests when they do get here. Uh, there is no increase in obligation, however, um, and any unspent funds will be sent back to 2020. So if the invoices come in less, then that remaining balance would go back to 2020. Um, so the staff recommendation here is obviously to, to reallocate those funds. Um, so this would need to, if uh, at the end, uh, when we do get into the, the action items, um, if you do uh, decide to reallocate these funds, um, that would come back to you um, in the form of a resolution uh, to formalize that. Okay. Motion, now, do we want a motion um, to I'd do like it? I'd like to do it at the end. If okay, I can right. go through um, all of this, uh, if Find you have us. questions about <laughs> items that I'm going over, and then at the end we can make a... Um, I was going to say, I'd take it while you can get it. Get yeah, one right. We may change, hey, I mean, what if we change our minds? <laughs> for it. We can, do, we can certainly do it. Bob, was that a motion, Bob? That was a motion. Okay. Was That's a, a second. And you've got a second. All in favor? Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. Just, just to get clear that one up. All right. We're Rachel, getting stuff done. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> you never know. We can't, we're pretty, you know, pretty <laughs> mercurial here. We All right. Mind, <laughs> <laughs> We're making progress. You don't want to have to explain it again later in the meeting after we forget what it was. Uh, the rest is walking through the, the site plan itself. Um, so to start off on the, the outside, so there's the areas that we're looking at is the central portion of the of the park and ride facility so this slide is intended to highlight the north and south lots um, there are no no improvements anticipated in either of those lots and currently the north lot um, is utilized primarily for overflow parking uh, while the south lot is utilized for overflow parking and um, primarily event staging and bus layover uh, so these are both anticipated to uh, be gated so the north lot is already gated uh, the south lot is anticipated to become gated um, unless there is some sort of event or a reason to be using those lots. Um, so the, as you can see the, if I have a cursor. There is a cursor there somewhere. You may need Do John Peacock one? or somebody to tell us how to use it. Our AV guy is coming up. Hold on a sec. <laughs> newly hired AV guy. So <laughs> I mean, he's Most important guy in the whole room, right? Hey, oh, yeah. see. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> see you so, next week. Right now, we've got the the gate up here for large trucks um, to enter the staging area, um, and then if this area does need to be used for parking, the anticipation is that they would enter through um, through this way and enter back out. And I'll talk about the kiosk location here in a few minutes. Uh, but that generally the uses of both of those areas are to remain um, unchanged as they as they exist today. Uh, moving on to the the bus and truck turnaround. So this is uh, we do have a lot of tractor trailers that enter this area. We have uh, have a lot of buses during special events. Um, right here uh, we've um, put in a bus stop. Uh, that can be utilized during during events. Um, so not on a routine basis, uh, but when um, the bus is uh, platform is overflowing, uh, we can then utilize this space up here, uh, say during X Games or Food and Wine or other other events like those. Uh, and then we have a pick up and drop off area directly adjacent to it. So on an everyday basis, this would be where people can um, drop passengers off, pick, pick passengers up, uh, but it can also double as an event bus stop um, 
when that's necessary in combination with, uh, with the other one on the turnaround. <laughs> And moving on to parking, there were, um, I heard some concerns about, oh, you're turning the whole lot into EV parking. Um, that is not the case. <laughs> uh, and I'll get into the, the EV conduit here in a few minutes. Uh, but generally, um, we're looking to <coughs> prep um, any space that has, that it abuts up against a, uh, a curb um, to be able to handle an EV charger potentially in the future. There's no funding um, or a, an opportunity really as a part of this grant to install those chargers. Uh, but we do have the opportunity to get some of the infrastructure in the ground to make it cheaper now um, and be able to kind of prove, future proof the lot to be able to do that as market demands uh, necessitate. Uh, but in terms of uh, general parking uh, or overall parking, it's supposed to be anticipated to be general uh, throughout the parking lot uh, with potential EV, any place where there's, it abuts a curb. Um, with handicap parking, obviously up near the front, um, some 15 minute parking that actually stood out in the surveys and in the adjacent property uh, owner discussions is they wanted some place where they could pull in, just stop for 15 minutes and pull back out again. Um, so we're hoping that in combination with some 15 minute parking here, directly adjacent to the entrance where they wouldn't have to wander through the lot, um, as well as the pick up and drop off area, uh, we should be able to accommodate that. Skippy. Yes. David, oh, sorry. What's the, um, what's the requirement for um, Oh, need a microphone. Uh, Lights on. What's, is it on? <laughs> now it is. Oh, okay. uh, what's the requirement for um, handicap parking, given, given the additional number yeah. of spaces that we're... We believe it's between about 10 and 12. My name's George. Oh, bring George. Hey, George, come on up. We need to get you on a mic. Come on. We can, we're, we're still and identify yourself for us before we start for the record indeed um, my name is George Walton I work with Jacob engineering um, we contract to federal lands I was a federal lands employee for 10 years that's kind of my background um, based on the number of spaces right now it's somewhere between 10 and 12 for ADA the existing spaces or based no on the proposed Gotcha. On the proposed spaces, yes. Um, David, why are we only thinking about uh, infrastructure for potential chargers on curbed spaces? Because that, those are the locations where we're able to get conduit on the ground to be able to run electricity to those spaces. Um, I did have conversations with the Department of Energy and um, CORE uh, and CLEAR about um, placing chargers down the center. Yeah. That's um, the thinking there was that, um, from their perspective, we're not there in terms of a market, um, and the, you would end up losing quite a few parking spaces because you have to allow the space for the chargers um, in between each of those. Uh, and the thinking was, we're, we're just not entirely clear where the market's going uh, to be able to make that kind of investment at this time. The market. The market and the technology. And the technology, The yes. hope is that in the future, the technology will have more, more um, confined or smaller right. chargers and we'll be able to put more in. Mm -hmm. The other thing is there's a, there's a variety of the slow chargers and the fast chargers right now um, to try. So people who wanted to come through town, we could always direct them there to, to use the charging stations if they're traveling on their way. Um, but the conduit will be laid now. And if in the future we find there's a greater market in 10 or 20 years, we probably need to be redoing some cement or pavement anyway. At that point, we could we could gear it up for whatever the market might be. To that point, what's the expected life on the pavement surface? Is it 20 years? On the pavement surface, yes. Okay. That's what I see. It's kind of that's, that's kind that's of a, a general design. estimate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and the only thing I might add is we're in in this project, we're also upsizing in coordination with Holy Cross, um, the uh, distribution system, and in plans for bus charging in the oh, future that's right. we have to do the and, bus. and conduit. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're we're getting ourselves set up for it. You know, one of the issues that's come to my attention is, is the uh, the use of the charging spaces by non by you know internal combustion vehicles blocking the chargers. In some cases, people think it's malicious. You know, mm -hmm. you hear you read mm -hmm. those things. Uh, so at some point, we may need to you know certainly mark them. But you know, all sorts of technologies are coming up to make sure only EVs can get to those chargers because it's a problem. It's It'll be places. an enforcement issue, which yeah. we have enforcement out there anyway. I, so. I'm not even sure which presentation I saw recently, but they talk about your first fine being $150 and your second fine being $250, mm -hmm. and people respond pretty quickly. That. Sure. 
Steve, um, there are a couple of technological things that are, we don't know which direction it's going to go, but one of them, there might be a lot of hydrogen fuel cell cars, might be the way the technology goes. It might not be that everybody has a plug-in electric car they need. And also there will probably be batteries that have a thousand mile range on them where people won't have to charge their cars so often. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, well, why don't we run conduit everywhere, all of, just no. all over every place, but then it's logical to put it where the curbs are because we have the space for the actual chargers there, and we don't have the space, like you said, all the other places. <clears throat> Right. This is all the reasoning that went into. While we're on the topic of digging in, oh, sorry, um, I'll let Marky go first. Yeah, I have a, a, Dave, you're real familiar with the e-bus program um, that EOTC, we've got eight buses, I think, on order right now. Right. Will there be a charging unit here for the buses? We've been discussing that with, with RAFTA, and they're not entirely sure um, on the technological side what okay. that's going to look like or exactly where it would be. Okay. What we're anticipating, so if you can see, um, this is a very bright cursor, isn't it? So we've got mm -hmm. um, the transformers right about here. Um, so we're looking at upgrading that to a three-phase 480 volt, which would be able to supply okay. those, the um, those buses. And so the idea is to place, and I'll talk about this a little bit later too, is place some conduit down here. Uh, in anticipation of buses being able to charge okay. down on this back edge. Thank you. Uh, but the specifics aren't yet determined. Because mm -hmm. I believe right now the plan is for them, we just upgraded the, the maintenance barn, Raft of, yeah, because mm -hmm. um, we just did some land easement swapping. Yeah. So that's going to be like the key place, I believe, from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Looking at your map real quick, I see clearly we've got a, a, some new pavement in there, and the, the concerns I have are just about drainage, and I'm, I know you guys are on top of it, but... Uh, we know it's also that mud is just like that Manco's mud that's so slippery and miserable over on the, the right side um, where, it, where it's not paved. Um, just wondering, how is that going to drain? Is the drain, drain doesn't have to go to the pond on the other side, for instance. I, I know you're on, just wanted to see how, how that's going to work. Cause Certainly. Um, the right above the, the uppermost um, red box is the natural swale. And that's where the trunk line is that goes from the pond on the south to the pond on the north. And throughout that are inlets. And then there's also some auxiliary inlets. And really what we're going to do is lay it right on the ground the way it drains today. Um, we can do that without doing much infrastructure change at all okay. um, and use those inlets which are all very upsized based on our, our research of the drainage study that was done. When you say endless, you're talking about an actual grate with a drain and a- Correct. And it can handle the chunks of Mancos shale, and that sticky, gooey stuff that we have up there. That's gonna be your job. Yeah, I'll be out there I, with a pipe cleaner. I can, I can, I've been down in every manhole out there. <laughs> okay. you and it's pretty this. clean. <laughs> okay. Um, the, there, there are several. Job I don't want. There are uh, there are several, at least one inlet in that south lot, and that can easily be handled if it becomes a problem, by doing some kind of BMP best management practice around it, okay. and still keep it draining. All right. Thanks. Ready to move on? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Look at the carpool kiosk. Uh, so this is the kiosk itself, as you know, is currently located at the airport. Um, and the city of Aspen has gone through the location and extent process through the county. Um, so that's already been completed. They're looking at moving that out to um, Brush Creek uh, here next month. Um, so the anticipation here, um, for those of you who, have, who haven't been through the conversation up, up till now, um, is that the, the kiosk would be placed on skids. Um, it would be movable um, up until the point where this plan is finalized and we're able to put down concrete and it's able to be um, permanently placed. Uh, but the location we're looking at now uh, is within this red circle. Um, it would be um, have asphalt running around uh, the outside for vehicles. Uh, it's been analyzed for stacking. Um, and then these round circles are delineators using boulders. Uh, the reason for that is opposed to using um, vertical curb uh, is that if the use of the south lot changes for some other um, 
um, parking or whatever it may be, um, it, we can uh, more easily rearrange that um, into whatever whatever we may need to in the future. Um, Initially, uh, we are looking at uh, when it moves out there in July, like I said, it would be placed on skids. It wouldn't be um, paved yet, uh, but we are looking at delineating it in this fashion um, so that we can um, analyze how it performs, um, what the stacking actually is, uh, what the impacts on the intersection are, um, and be able to make adjustments from there before we're, we have a, a finalized plan. So if there are any changes, we would be back to you with those uh, recommendations uh, next spring. Okay. I am going to say something. Um, this is a difficult one for me because of we already have a congested intersection at Brush Creek and Highway 82 in the morning hours. This is going to be putting more traffic in and out of there. So I would really like us, since we're moving it in July now, um, I think we really need to start looking at monitoring if what the traffic impacts, the negative ones maybe for people having to pull in and pull out of there. Not just at the intersection, but when you come to the intersection where the buses pull in and out, if you drive out there, as I'm sure we all do, that's kind of a difficult transit, you know, to get back out onto the highway with who's turning in, who's going right, who's going straight. So I think we just need to monitor that since we have the time before actually constructing this project to keep an eye on what that early morning or that, that, that um, commuter time in the morning might impact those intersections and the flow of traffic. And as a, as a designer, it's a wonderful opportunity to have that right. mobility. And we need to make sure the public knows it's moving in July. It's not moving in July of 2020. It's moving in a couple weeks so that they're not driving to the airport and having to turn around because I'm going to send those calls to somebody other than me. <laughs> Ward? Yeah, the <clears throat> traffic signal there, how is that controlled? Well, is, that's See easily that? adjustable for the... As the traffic study shows that uh, people for the kiosk are getting backed up, does that flip a uh, green light for a left turn on to 82, or how is that? I believe that's demand. Yeah, it's demand. I, I'm, not, I'm not certain, it's but demand. it's certainly yeah. easily it's changeable. That's a demand signal. Yeah, I'm in and out there all the yeah, time. Yeah, because at night, it, it, at night it's yeah, demand. It's night, yeah. So, so it's by know, a sensor that if, yeah. if it, mm -hmm. okay. So it's variable throughout the uh, day. Yep. Ra Rachel? Um, just to follow up on Patty's comment, and I'm not sure this is really EOTC, as perhaps uh, City of Aspen Transportation, but when we're dealing with the um, HOV uh, tagging and the kiosk, um, you always hear that a lot of people choose to drive their children to school <coughs> so they will qualify for an HOV pass. And so all we're doing is encouraging people to drive kids to school rather than be on the bus and create further traffic congestion at the Maroon Creek Roundabout. So I think we need to talk with the city about how that's done. And if, you know, if it's not in the school year, it means one thing. But if it's during the school year and you're probably just a fifth grader in your seat, you don't qualify. And so I just want to make sure we're managing that well and it doesn't become a bit of an abuse system there that adds to the problem Patty was already talking about. Yeah, but that's a, that would be a tough one to say, well, I have a doctor's appointment today, or my kid has sports after school. Yeah, so I need but it's the same person in the kiosk day after day, and if someone comes in five days a week to say I have a doctor's appointment with this fifth grader, they start to know. Well, that's going to be it. I don't disagree, but I think that's going to be a tough one. In yeah, it's not easy. Yeah. I'm Steve. Uh, if there is a big traffic backup with cars trying to get into the parking kiosk and cars leaving there trying to get on Highway 82 that's causing congestion, all we have to do is move the kiosk more towards the, the turnaround area down there on one side or the other, and then that gives more, more road space for cars waiting in the queue to get either their parking permit or to get back on the highway. So I think that would be a simple fix if we find out that it is mm -hmm. causing too much congestion. And probably would need, maybe need to adjust the timing of the light, too, to allow for a little bit longer left turn awesome. coming out of there towards agree. Aspen. It's not going to be good. I, don't, I really, just me, I, I think what's going to happen is people will go over and get on Smith Way and take the back way in versus turning left to come into Aspen, which, which is already congested. So they'll go back down uh -huh. and around? Mm -hmm. Never even thought of that. To some extent, people already do. Yeah, that's, that's, people that's what will. I do. Oh, yeah. sure. That has been mentioned, and uh, Mitch uh, Osier, the director of parking, and I 
um, are geared up to monitor um, okay. how this how this actually happens. Because a lot of this we just won't know unless you're out there watching um, how people are reacting to it. Well, that, that I mean that point is is something else to add into the traffic study because yep. if we're we're only thinking about making the left to go into Aspen, well maybe we have to think about both directions and how much that right turn has been impacted mm -hmm. by moving the um, kiosk. Mm -hmm. well, the problem is, is this summer, we probably won't have people wanting to use McLean Flats roads because <coughs> of construction. <laughs> so. construction. Well, Patty, that's actually yeah, going yeah, pretty I, well. I've been, I've been riding yeah. up there a lot lately, and it doesn't seem to be, stop, be stopping yeah. cars. Well, there are plenty of cars going God up did there. the part that will. <coughs> okay, yeah. let's bring it back here. Uh, John, come on up if you want to say something. John Kruger, Director of Transportation for the City of Aspen, and I was just texting Lynn. She says that the carpool uh, or the HOV permit is supposed to be driving age only uh, in Villager. So we worked on that before when I didn't know that. kids and, and also er, er, all sorts of other things and babies were in there. Are so you taking some steps? Yeah, we already done that. So that the person handing those out or looking at um, driving age individuals <coughs> count. <coughs> Not else. So on top of it, but those look at that. are driving at earlier ages. All they the got time. the car seats with the wheels. John, quick question. Just, just a quick question for you, John. Uh, the idea of a kiosk and a person handing out these passes seems a, a little outdated to me. Is there any other new technology that's being applied to carpool passing? Is this um, something that's like our our future, or is there a brighter one? No, I mean uh, Mitch Osier, the director of parking for the city, is looking at a cell phone or some other technically technologically way to solve that rather than <laughs> handing the permit out so he's doing some research and looking at that Take a um, selfie because you understand that it's a it's a body it's whatever but also there's a lot there's some good interaction there too sometimes between the person in the car and not but they're looking at trying to solve it in a technologically better way thanks Maybe if there, you know, three or more active cell phones in any car it gets a permit <laughs> every car even with one person sometimes <laughs> with three phones. Uh, uh, could I ask one question about the the egress that rafta uses is that a rafta right-of-way only when rafta is heading down valley their buses so go here. off that way yep. just wondering if that's ever considered as cars as well maybe a bad idea but just wanted this to is this see if it's this considered. access here is currently gated right um, what, the one We're not that's only supposed to get vehicles. We get some straggler vehicles that don't realize they're supposed not supposed to be back here. Right. right. I was thinking about the rafter buses go out that way for their down valley traffic, right? They do. If, yes. if that intersection became too congested, would it, would it help to have that as an option for running traffic? It could, and that is actually an option uh, that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. And you can see the outline of a realignment of that of that access point here. Okay. All right. So, sorry. We'll. Uh, Right. Do you have that a would be interesting or? once they get on the highway. Oh, yeah. You've got buses coming in, people trying to get over to Smith Hill Road, buses trying to pull over at Smith Hill Road, and people trying to merge into the. We've got that already. Yeah. But <laughs> okay. Let's we got to let's keep control. it moving here. All right. So looks like nice right. peak parking. Uh, moving on to the <laughs> the restroom uh, area. So just as a reminder, uh, the restroom location is mid station. This was decided um, on March twenty first. Um, one of the benefits to this is it does have the special events or info booth area. Mm -hmm. um, so that area uh, is located directly adjacent to the restrooms, which is actually kind of hard to see here, but it's this green box would be the restrooms. Uh, and then this dotted uh, green box uh, is, uh, is the uh, special events flex space. Um, so as uh, Steve brought up earlier, there are three options um, for this area, one being open, uh, one being covered and one being partially enclosed. Uh, there are some benefits to each one, benefits and drawbacks. Um, the open, uh, as you may have noticed from the packet, is the, the staff recommendation, um, mostly because it allows the greatest amount of flexibility in the near term and we don't really have a good idea how this space might um, want to be utilized. Um, it's also within the budget, um, <laughs> which as we know, um, we're getting very close to. Uh, the covered option uh, obviously has uh, limits the flexibility to a certain extent. So say a special event wants to put up tents and they've got a canopy, then they're limited by that canopy. 
Um, it does provide some um, protection from the elements for um, everyday users, uh, which is certainly a benefit. Um, the cost has been estimated at 600000 I think I, I would caveat that by saying that this um, covering, and George can elaborate on this more, um, is it's intended to be enclosed very easily. So it's not just your standard picnic cover, um, as well as supporting uh, solar panels if that's desired on there as well. Um, and then the partially enclosed, um, that uh, I've got some renderings that show this a little bit later too, um, encloses the back portion. Uh, we're not anticipating that that would be an enclosed area that would be available to the public on an everyday basis, but would be available for special events. So say during maroon bells uh, time, it could be used as a, as a visitor center, um, that kind of thing. Great. Dave, how are we doing on time? Just want to make sure. Are you on track here? Just want to make, keep track of our schedule. Um, I think we're a little over. Okay. Right. So Talk faster. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> no more questions. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah. We uh, so this is the rendering of the open design. I just like to, to emphasize here that even if it is open, there is still protect, covered protection for uh, those utilizing the the transit facilities. So we have an overhang as part of the the restroom facility. Um, so this this is the new restroom facility. Uh, rendered. Uh, the furnishings out here, these are just placed here for scale. We haven't made any, there hasn't been any determinations on those. Um, and then back here, this is the existing um, bus platform. So that would still be in place too um, for covering. Uh, and then this is a, uh, a rendering of the, of the covered option. Uh, so as you can see, it uh, basically covers that, that area, um, has some solar panels on top. Oops. And then the partially enclosed uh, encloses the back portion in a similar manner, um, similar architectural style to the existing um, rafta facility and the restroom facility. Yeah. The the one thing I would offer is is if we go with basically no structure open, we do still intend to from the ex from the proposed restroom stub utilities over there, so we've got um, we've got that flexibility if we if we go that way. Bob, uh, Greg, a um, couple of things. I mean, I'm. First of all, uh, the idea to me of $600,000 to put cover on seems like an awful lot of money for a little cover, for a cover, a little bigger, whatever it is. Okay. So th that brings a couple things to mind. One is I'd like to see what a quote is of a more basic cover that doesn't have to fit in with a, an enclosure 10 years from now or some other time. And I would also like to know um, if solar panels are put on the roof, um, how, much, how much electricity can they divert? Um, where would that electricity go? Would it be used for lighting? Would it be just put back into the grid? What would we do with it? And, and how does that offset the cost of um, the solar panels themselves? Mm -hmm. uh those are all good questions, and I, at this point, I don't think that we're prepared to answer. I understand. I know. Um, I understand that. But that's the that's the direction that we're looking to get here today, so that we can continue to look into those. Marky, I think it's really important that some of us who have used Rafta in the park and ride lot for years, and I, when I was working in Wood Springs, I would ride Rafta. and the, that's when the bus connections and snow mass were not the 15 minutes. Sometimes you'd be there. 30 minutes to 45 minutes waiting for the bus in the elements, snowy, yucky weather, and $600,000 to me is cheap <laughs> to stay somewhat warm. Um, there's nothing worse. It discourages you, it dis begins to discourage you from in the winter using Rafta if you know you've got a long mm -hmm. wait. Right. So I'm, right. I'm sorry, but that's just. Steve? Yeah, I've been out there when it's cold. Um, Even then, Rachel, in the Steve. long term, I would like to see a really nice enclosed building yeah. there something akin to the town park station yeah town park station or even ruby <coughs> park yeah. but um right now i th another option to look at that might be less expensive would be to change if the type of covering uh, the Just bus the waiting area and Snow's make it more in. enclosed yeah. because if the wind is blowing and you're there for half an hour <clears throat> yeah. in the winter time yeah and even with degrees. the little heaters there yeah. you get cold it's cold 
So that that would be an, an alternative. Um, so I think for right now, I would favor just leaving no structure there in the special events thing and do more planning and thinking about what do we want to actually have it be like and accomplish before we go and build anything there. Uh, Rachel? Yeah, a really good conversation. And it just brings up a lot of things for me. If we're getting back to the purpose that we saw many months ago of is there going to be some place you can get coffee or can you, you know, you know what what is it? it? And it's gone from when it was like pictures of a little cafe and a food truck with some potted trees to a special events kiosk. And so that change, I don't know where that, that terminology change happened. But again, if it's about offering amenities to the people who are trying to get to park there and ride there and maybe have a phone line they can use or God knows what else, then it, it demands a different type of structure than just unenclosed. And so I think we need to keep an eye on what the purpose is. The second thing that really struck me is I was thinking, you know, when this first opened, there weren't any EVs, and we didn't worry about electric charging stations and how much things change over time. But uh, a long, long time ago, we built uh, park and ride um, parking at the airport with EOTC money that later became abandoned and became rental car parking. I don't think we ever got paid back the money from having created that parking lot for the EOTC. But the bigger point is that this will still change. What we think we're designing well now uh, will have different needs 10 years from now. Um, I would agree with Marky. It sounds like a lot, but it probably isn't when you consider getting all the electricity and utilities in a building that will withhold the snow and things like that. So, you know, we have to think about what is it really going to be used for? If, if we're thinking there's going to be an employee out there, whether they're the Chamber of Commerce or Snowmass Village Marketing or anyone to talk to the guests, or is it just going to be a bulletin board spot, you know, and brochure spot? I, I don't know what we're hoping the amenities will be in this special events kiosk. But if there's an employee going to be there, it needs to be at least partially enclosed so they don't freeze in the winter, you know, and so people go in and they feel like staying for a few minutes rather and, oh, we'll look at that when we get back. It's too cold. And then they never look at it, you know. Um, so I wonder whether there would be any value in reaching out to some of our other potential marketing partners and people concerned about the guest experience to see if they could help fund this a little bit. Maybe the ACRA and Snowmass Village's mm -hmm, marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, Forest Service might even have a small program for things like this, for guest information and, and um, you know, others. Um, so, for, uh, so anyhow, ski company. I just thought, you know, maybe we should think bigger and more clearly about what we really want the space to accomplish. I think that that's okay. that's a good point, uh, and that's that's part of the thinking behind recommending that it stay open for now, mm -hmm. um, so that we can get these facilities in place and tackle that as a, uh, more of a phase two, as opposed to building say a cover or something there and then say oh boy we didn't we didn't think right. this through all the way. Right. Yeah, um, just like clarification from you guys and, and from you, David. Um, I keep hearing the word special event, and it's not clear to me. Um, does the scope of special event simply mean? parking for a special event and information about a special event? Or is there a thought that one day, whether uh, adjacent or not, there might be a special event near or on this facility? I think it could go either way. They, the initial thinking right now is that this would be, this could be a location, um, say, Ride the Rockies comes through. Um, this, we've got bike paths on both sides. Uh, we might be able to, to utilize it there. Okay. Um, so is our Tough mutter as a registration area, um, that that kind of thing. So, so hearing that, um, which is also kind of where my mind went, that would be a possibility in the future. Um, should we be concerned with uh, enclosure or not enclosure around safety concerns? So, you know, either a hailstorm or something darker, right? Um, does that play into this decision at all for you? And are you thinking about this enclosure in that way at all? Uh, not necessarily, because most of these events come with their own tents. Um, and so part of the thinking is if they may have their own structures that they want to put up for that type of rest area or registration or whatever it may be. Um, so that is also one of the benefits I, I see as part of the open is it, it allows for that level of flexibility. Okay. And if they think that they need, need to be able to do okay. that. Well, so, I mean, given that, um, I, I certainly think having an enclosed facility offers a lot more than an unenclosed. However, 
the desire to have one doesn't mean we have to overpay for one. And certainly looking at that line item and there's real dollars from real people, um, taxpayers and, and the federal government. So, you know, for 840 grand, I got a buddy building a six bedroom house somewhere. It's not here, but uh, I would want some really good rationale for why those dollars are good spent. And I think the one, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I, I guess I just need would like a clarifying question, and, and thank you, Rachel, because I was thinking, how do we bring our partners in to both help pay for this and figure out what we're looking at? But my understanding right now is none of that six hundred thousand is part of is available in this grant, right. right? So we might have an opportunity to kind of revisit this brainstorming in the context of EOTC budget discussions, um, rather than holding up any design elements from this mm -hmm. if we accept the staff recommendation. Is that true? Is that yeah. an accurate interpretation? Okay, that's George? what I wanted to clarify. Thank the, you. Thank the only thing I wanted to add that I don't think has been um, said here yet is as we've been doing our work, is it open, covered, and closed? We can certainly either now if we go that way or for you folks later down the road, it could certainly be constructed in such a way that it was covered and not enclosed, mm -hmm. and then it could be mm -hmm. easily enclosed. So just just to throw that out there, because I don't think that had been said yet. Patty? Well, I'm actually supporting the covered with solar um, panel potential because I'm looking at solar use for the EV chargers, for the not the increased lighting, but the extension of lighting so we can generate electricity to help operate the facility itself. Makes we're going to have bathrooms that have to be lit. We're going to have security. We're going to have a lot more electric needs. And I think it's, if we're looking at trying to be a sustainable project, we need to be putting solar there wherever we can and bring it back in. And we have partners we're looking at with the um, maybe the governor's office of energy, the, the federal and core and clear. So we, we have partners we can bring in to help us with that which would also help maybe with the cover facility for the solar on this bit. Before we move on, if that's, we're getting close here. The other thing I want to make sure is that orientation of the solar panels is appropriate. The roof, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the right aspect, but just want to make and sure. I've got, I've got another slide for the solar, uh, um, so we can talk about that here in a few minutes. And also during your survey, I'm, I'm sure we have the neighbors up on the hill, either on either side, are probably concerned about a growing development there. If it starts growing into something much bigger, we're going to hear about that. So mm -hmm. we have to be mindful as we're designing the next thing. You mean your neighborhood? That's my neighborhood as well as across <laughs> as well. Yeah, I, I, as we were talking about flex space and closing, heating, doing all these other things, we should take a close look at the land use that, that is allowed there. And if we're um, overreaching what is it, what's approved and what's acceptable. Um, I have ideas on the solar. <laughs> the rest of the council knows that. But, uh, Bob, I think it would just go back into the grid. Okay, uh, what, Steve? What I suggest as we uh, <coughs> carry this forward to future EOTC meetings, if the construction's not till 2021, mm -hmm. conceivably at our retreat and at future meetings, we could come up with a more thought on this and design and still do it on, you know, pay for it from a different means and it doesn't have to hold up any of the flap grant stuff and we might still be able to do the construction at the same time do you see a way forward to do that if we approve this today or is if, if the logistics of that start to become a little bit more difficult um, mostly because um, and George maybe you can speak to this a little bit more um, is the, prog the progress going forward now to 70 percent um, and getting per making sure we've got permitting going through um, for the, the core aspects of the grant uh, and making sure that's done on time. Um, we also don't want to have uh, the engineering um, team spending time on things that don't actually come to fruition, like I said, because we want to be able to focus their energies on things that, um, yeah, actually So we need, to, we need to hone this down a bit and make a decision here that's going to help help you move it. Yeah, my, my thinking is there's, there's a lot of loose ends around this area. Um, and I think that there's a lot of desires um, and there's a lot of possibilities. 
uh, and there's a lot of restrictions too, like like what we're saying with with land use, uh, that need to be evaluated, um, as well as um, like you were saying with the, the adjacent property owners and what's what's actually feasible from their perspective. And I don't know that those have been fully vetted at this time. Rachel, yeah, um, just to move us along and maybe uh, do a straw poll. I would suggest going with the staff recommendation at mm -hmm. this time and then us drilling down further to kind of a statement of need and purpose of this special event center. Can that be a and, motion? And look at <coughs> designing and editing later if need be. But I would stick with the budget and what we have as a staff recommendation. Is that a motion? It is a motion. I'll second. Okay. Uh, then uh, further discussion? Now, before we all voted together, but do we still have to vote as? Snowmass Village. Oh, we didn't Separately. do that the first time. Do we have to come back to it? I told you we'd be back. We to didn't. That. It was it was unanimous though, so I think it's safe to say that. <laughs> yeah. And I was just getting it on there to focus discussion. Right. Okay. Uh, no, just in terms of discussion, I, I'd be supportive of that. I think it's the right thing to do to keep it moving forward. Um, I want to be respectful of all of your guys' process being new here, but I do have some thoughts about the broader picture. So I'll just leave it to you to let me know when they'd be appropriate to bring it in at this meeting or others. Okay. Uh, um, I, we have a motion and we have a second. Do I want to break it down into Snowmass, Aspen, and Pitkin, or do we want to? I would call it if it looks close. Okay, we'll let's, let's call the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Are All right. Any opposed? Uh, any opposed? Thank you. I didn't. Well, I was close. Well, I was close. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking All for right. uh, anybody's Anybody's opposed? Just for the is, Yeah, we did. She did. Uh, uh, <laughs> now, Skippy, is, is your comment on this? Should we move along? or do I, you think, want I think we can move along. Just what Rachel okay. was talking about, Great. sort of the long-term vision and how we can bring that about. I have some ideas. I'm sure they aren't Great. new, but cool. I just want to make sure they end up on a agenda for discussion at some point. Great. We All have, right. Have any remind me if we don't get back. If I don't get back here, remind you. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. All right. You got it. Thanks. Okay. So yeah. Two down. How many? <laughs> We've got a lot. Oh, sorry, there Marky. There is a <laughs> Thursday night concert in Snowmass. It starts at 6. <sighs> I've got a thing to be at at 6, too. So I think we, so we, we have an hour to finish the rest of the Just say it, guys. We're through this. Yeah. All right. I will rip through these things as fast as I can. Um, so just to let you know, there was some discussion about boards. Uh, we are looking at a, a board area similar to what's in Ruby Park um, to identify special events, um, things going on, uh, RAFTA on uh, schedules, that kind of thing. Um, backup restrooms. Um, so we are looking at some maintaining some portable toilets out there. Mm -hmm. um, on the back side of the permanent restrooms, uh, this would be a screened, covered area um, for uh, restrooms that can be used uh, during events. So keep in mind that this facility is going to be served by a septic system. You get a whole bunch of people out there, you can overwhelm that. Um, so we need to uh, we need to have backup. We have call a backup. these a over, we have overflow. A backup, we need overflow. A overflow. <laughs> um, we're also, for security reasons, looking at closing the permanent rest restrooms during mm -hmm. Um, the evening or during the night, um, mm -hmm. but we still need some place for those people to go, and also during maintenance Big times. Dogs. Yeah, we don't right. want them using bushes. Okay, we get it. Um, this is a, another item um, for discussion uh, in pavement snow melt. Um, staff uh, recommendation is to move forward with in pavement snow melt. Um, Solar. Because of the um, the safety, right, the um, safety concerns that it promotes, or <laughs> yeah, more. it promotes safety. Um, it also encourages transit use because it's um, people aren't jumping over snow piles or slipping and falling. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some lower costs um, in terms of hi having to hire people, but the downside is it does uh, it is a major consumer of power. Um, so that's we're, we're looking. That's the direction we're looking at going uh, is having that facility. But I know that there are some. Um, some opinions out there, and I want to open up the. So, um, David, I, I know we had this discussion uh, at our meeting Monday night, but if it doesn't go in the direction, we could always just have the pipes put in the ground, and if they decide to add the mechanical room later, that would be the option. Mm -hmm. That's what I suggest, mm -hmm. okay? So, no matter what mm -hmm. is brought up, put the pipes in the cement, and mm -hmm. whether or not the budget's there or not, the pipes could be tied into a boiler. I don't agree with the geothermal, mm -hmm. it's not going to work, and I don't agree with solar. solar because we've had winters where the sun didn't shine from December 12th till the end of January. Solar is not going to help a snow melt system. If we have battery backup, we might. <laughs> Yeah. I'd, I'd vote against putting a snow it. melt system in. We're at trying any to rate, stop anyway. using it, right? My suggestion would be to put the pipes in the cement. If yeah. it's a budget item, at least the pipes are in the cement, and something could be done later on. Yeah. 
Good point. Yeah, Rachel. Uh, well, I was going to say we discussed it um, as well. Was it Tuesday night or Monday night? Who knows? Uh, the week's gone by fast. Um, and I think we reached a conclusion that uh, we should go forward with the snow melt because uh, of the safety issues right. and the concerns <laughs> going forward. You explained it's really fairly minimal on the platform. It's not, you know, uh, overly lengthy uh, type of thing. Um, and, you know, on solar, I definitely want to have solar on the roof of the restrooms and things like that. It is true. It just goes into the grid because we don't have storage. But we also then pull out of the grid to light the lights. I mean, so it is a bit of a wash one way or the other. And the more energy that we can generate on site, I am in full agreement with Patty on that um, uh, to offset what our impacts are. But uh, I, I just, you, you know, we have snowfall sometimes, and you could have somebody out there clear it, and it's a big mess again 45 yep. minutes later. And so that's where I think there's real value to having snow melt. I, um, limited areas and limited application, but this is public safety, and, you know, we might see I thousands and thousands total, of people. Totally today. agree with you, Rachel. Yeah. That's, you know, I'm just saying, looking at a budget point. If it's oh, and I'm, I budget, agree with your your philosophy on it as well. I was just saying I don't agree with dropping it out of the project. No, at this no, point. I, and I'm, if, if, if there's any way it can happen, I agree with you. Okay, Steve. I would also agree with plumbing it for the mm -hmm. uh, glycol type of system in the future. I would love to see it be heated by a ground heat assisted sort of a system, uh, ideally, instead of a natural gas one, but we could work with core and uh, you know, I think technology is probably getting better in that field, and maybe there will be something in the future. But in the meantime, we could be doing it with the natural gas. You know, working with cores, it's all going to be electrified. And so, you know, heat pumps and everything else, they're, it's not about fossil fuels with core. But, but one way or another, if we, we try to reach out to core, they're not going to be interested unless it's all electrified. Mm -hmm. and that being yeah. a heat pump or some sort. And now, meanwhile, that will help the solar situation to run the heat pump. Yeah. Well, the, the new, there's some new technology on ground source heat pumps, but I don't know if this, the scale of what would be um, needed here justifies it if, it, if it's a break-even point. So um, philosophically, I, I like the idea of having an electrical uh, ground source, but I just don't. No, and as we go forward, we um, uh, we can look at what new technology is available and what the scale is to make it worthwhile. And, and based on our initial um, calculations, um, I don't know that you would get enough out of it to warrant putting it in. Okay. I don't know that you would get that much back. I, I, well, I'm not an expert at it, but um, that's my field, mm -hmm. snow melt and, and stuff. And believe me, the water coming out of the ground is only going to be about 50 degrees. We need about 110 degrees to melt decent snow. I'm, a, I'm right there with you. Okay, so it's, geo, geo is not going to work. I agree. Okay, we'll be spending too much money on electric to boost the temperature <clears throat> of the water. Okay. What, 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 I'm gonna, just real quick because it's been bouncing around, and I'd just like to get it out there. Um, with the solar... Typically, it goes to the grid, but if you're producing more than you're using, right. your meter spins backwards. Right. right. So you are using it both ways. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, do we need, uh, we well, since we're in our. Sustainability and security lighting. Yes, those should be easier, I think. Um, um, w since we're on the topic, do you want to call this one right now? Does anybody want to have a motion seems on to be this? Working. Yeah. Uh, a motion uh, for a, a snow melt plumbed, but uh, that take it only that far until we design it further. I move to plumb it for the snow melt system using the glycol, the natural gas glycol. By, by the way, how many how many square feet are we talking about here, David? Uh, George. The the platform is. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat here for a moment. It's about 40 feet wide, 43, I believe. And it is roughly 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, plus an, about 175 feet. Okay. 6,000 square feet. Six, so you're looking at a very large boiler here. I mean, That's just, what okay. we've been coming right. up with. So I mean, you might want to cut down some of the square footage, okay? Because, you know, basically you're looking at 115 BTUs per square foot. That's the minimum. 
we and and we actually did in our field reviews and discussions we have cut it back some already and we've also built in flexibility for if a new uh, if the info and special events building goes in it can easily be transitioned yeah. but I'll, I'll second Steve's uh, we've got a motion. motion and a second further discussion yeah I just have, I have a question because I'm not a snow melt expert and probably some of the public isn't um, regardless of whether we go electric solar boiler otherwise the plumbing that we're talking about will be the same it's simply where the electricity comes from to right. plummet so right. to make sure so okay. if it's electric it's still going to have a glycol it's still going to have pipes okay and you know that doesn't change the okay. system uh, Rachel yeah I'm full agreement with the motion um, just want to make sure it was clear as well that not only plumbing the planning for where a boiler would go or things would go to connect Absolutely. even if we're not putting it in and then secondly when we talked about it uh, Monday night we talked about making sure we have some real control to on off it and that it you know that when we have that warm spell in January for three weeks it's, it's not running all the time well, I mean, every every snow melt sen uh, system now has to have a slab sensor that okay. is activated by moisture and temperature. Got it. Thank you. So it will not activate if it's uh, above 35 degrees. Okay. Fantastic. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. <clears throat> Check. Moving right along. All right. So just <laughs> clarification for me. So we're putting the put the pipes in. Um, if we do find that we have money in the budget to put in a boiler, um, and continue that. Uh, Back to us. Yeah, we should move forward. Just do it. Okay. And, and speaking to Rachel's question, we are sizing the mechanical room to be ready for it. Good. And we're looking at over 6,000 square feet of mm -hmm. heated space there. That's and, and by the way, real quickly, that could be, like zoned. Could, be, it could be zoned. It could be zoned. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, if there's a need, for, if we have some that's on, that's on the south side, Center. maybe the north side walkway might need more. We it's need just it a there. matter of a couple more sensors and, and different pumps. Okay. And we're, we've in working with, with RAFTA, you can deduct out the footprint of the restroom because it'll have its own system. I, I want to suggest an obligation to bring Corey in just so we, you know, They've they may. Been brought in. Yeah, okay. So they're part of this. Just, as the state, as the feds. As right. Okay. Please. Thank you. Because I, I don't want to put in a system that we're going to regret or be embarrassed by right. five years from now. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. No system. <coughs> so, uh, okay. Now we're moving right along to. The next one is, is solar. Um, I, uh, from a staff side, we've been pushing uh, solar on the roof of any building that we're putting in. Um, the cost of that is about fifty to $100,000 based on the size of the array. Um, because of uh, visual impacts, uh, we haven't gone down the road of evaluating uh, any ground-mounted arrays yet. Um, so I wanted to get a feeling from you whether you would like us to pursue um, looking into ground mounted uh, that would be we're kind of looking at over in this area um, so not not anything big but something that could track the sun and but more efficiently capture it and keep them on the roof too both and and do both um, now the downside here is that we obviously we can get some grants from holy cross um, and um, and uh, core however uh, the money would need to be fronted by the eotc in order to do that and then the grant money is paid back I mean, that money's paid back through the grants from Holy Cross or Corps. A certain percentage. Um, if you do decide to go down this road, I would need to uh, get in touch with Corps to get a coach, and we start working on it at that point. Well, I think there should be a question. Yeah, I'd like to explore as much as we can. Do we have a motion? I think we shouldn't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we need a motion? Right. That was yeah. my motion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It was my brought to you. Support solar. And then I'll, I'll second. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you, further discussion, me. Kelly? Um, I just would would caution that there be some outreach about any ground mounted solar with the surrounding neighborhoods because yeah, be we that. know that to be a flag mm -hmm. um, and a concern. It, it's already. possible the orientation of ground mounted might actually be less offensive to the neighbors than the roof mounted. Just We're thinking, look, do both. We'll have to look at both. I'd like to look at Board. possibly locating it further back towards the river. It's out of the view plane of uh, of cars, but. Um, definitely support ground mounted, probably dual access tracking. We also have to take into consideration that's in a flight path. We need to make sure we have FAA clearance. Which Dave. And I, I brought this up before, but it's also the wood folks uh, from the other side are really concerned about the visual effects of the mm -hmm. parking lot. It is because of the visual impacts I wanted to bring this to you. 
Got it. I, I, it sounds like we're, we've got a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. David, when you do bring that back, can we just get some uh, firm numbers to the best of our knowledge in terms of uh, cost and annualized return and, and energy as well for each different? Because you're going to come back with probably a few options. So yeah. just want some hard data on that in terms yeah. of annual yeah. expectations. I, I feel comfortable voting yes for that, but we also don't have any visual representation whatsoever. We're looking right. at a red dot aerially, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to be important to get some, some look at what uh, ground mounted will It'll look come like. Back. We get a year right. and a half to talk about it. Okay. I think you've got, you've got direction on that. Yeah, we didn't vote. So, David, right. are you going to? We didn't vote. We didn't oh, all in favor. Did we? We, we voted. Did. Yes. Yeah, we did. We did. I said, I you were really close to it. <laughs> uh, Patty? So, so I'm voting or, David, yeah, I'm going to move right into sustainability for you. Um, I think, of course, we should be building anything as sustainable as possible, not going for LEED certification because of the expense, but following those principles as closely as we can. How's that for presenting your Take sustainability that issue? Wow. We well rehearsed done, it upstairs Daddy. earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a second from motion Skippy on that. Approval. Does that one um, right? I'll make a motion to approve the sustainability issue to look at utilizing LEED's principles but not pursuing LEED certification. Second. Further discussion? Steve. I think we should exceed LEED specifications and not, not seek LEED the official designation. Let's do better than LEED if we can. Good point. I can support Board. I think an aspiration towards net zero, but not I will lead amend my motion to include uh, exceeding leads as, as best as we can, if, if possible. <coughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Did you, did you, okay, my amendment. I, I okay. Fine with it. okay. <laughs> Just the, Moving right along. David, I'm leaving security. I'm trying to get Marky to her concert. <laughs> okay. I'm trying. Why don't you go and do Marky? Uh, egress, I believe that we've already really covered this. We are looking at, um, relocating the egress farther down. Um, it would still be gated up here, so it wouldn't be an everyday use, um, but could be used during special events in the same extent well, that the current one is. Uh, but we minimize these bus vehicle conflicts that we currently have okay. uh, when it is okay. utilized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Concerts at 630. Um, EV charging conduit, I believe that we've covered this already, but yep. this, these lines indicate where we're looking at that so conduit. So we can get out of here. Uh, and then security. Uh, you go. Do you want, oh, you want me to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go for <laughs> um, so we've discussed lighting. Um, obviously, lighting covers the whole thing. We'll be back to you uh, in the spring with more details there. Um, the big question now is should we be pursuing um, and what's your comfort level um, with the cameras and call boxes? Right now, staff is considering cameras and call boxes in the restroom facility um, and just call boxes out in the parking area. Cameras and call boxes in the vicinity of the restroom facility. Is that what you were saying? Okay. Yeah. So Rafta currently has cameras on the on their platform. So, so David, the call boxes will they have the blue light like they did do down in Ant Shoots and different campuses down in the front range, so people could identify uh, where the call box is. I, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. David, I have no problem with cameras or boxes, but back to Tori's point earlier and our points about costs. I mean. You know, one, what is the added cost of those cameras? Could they be placed elsewhere? And are they actually needed? Is that an evidence-based approach? Are there incidents that need to be seen? Mm -hmm. um, I would say, and uh, David Johnson's here. Yeah, David's back there. Back there. What have you done, David? Um, Come up, David. <laughs> Bring, him on up. Bring the victim up. <laughs> to pull on him. Um, uh, briefly on his experience. Yeah. Uh, he's with RAFTA um, and his experience with cameras at the the, on the rafta side. Oh, our experience? Yeah. Yeah, every, everybody who wants to come up to the... <laughs> come for us. Okay. All right. Thanks, George. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, George. David, come on up. I was making Thanks. sure I knew what I was going to talk about at <laughs> 6 o'clock or so, so I may have missed that, a little bit of that. So you want to know our experience with um, cameras, ca cameras and, and monitoring or seeing? Um, well, um, it's kind of a it's it's a mixed bag because um, we we do use them and we do um, provide they do record a lot of activity and we can go back and look at that um, and they and and it's all and it's been very helpful to RAFTA. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but it is um, it takes a lot of work to um, to go back and find things we, we get a lot of requests particularly from law enforcement and that's great we love we, we you know we, we're, we're glad to, to use that information we spent a lot of money on this and we're glad to put it to good use but it takes um, it takes a lot of time to find that and I think you'll find that that when you use these things and you have a lot of them and you have to go back and retrieve them it, it, it's going to take staff time um, to, to uh, to, uh, whose, whose budget is that from? Uh, yours. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I, don't know. But I, I think in light of that, you know, we had one significant that comes to mind, which was a, a, dis, a disturbance between some campers mm -hmm. out there where a weapon was drawn of sorts. And um, I think that alarmed a lot of people who may have changed their mind about parking out there. So I think having cameras and utilizing when we need to to pull information is, is more than appropriate. Um, you know, sometimes they just post up security camera and there's no camera to be that seen. Works, yeah. yeah. So, but I think we actually need to have them to go back on if need be. Tori? Has the sheriff's office been consulted or talked to about this and given us their input? Not at this point. So right now we're looking for your comfort level uh, before we start pursuing that, that direction. I think we should definitely bring Joey in. Good, great idea. Great, great idea. idea. Yeah, certainly. Um, it seems like this is standard practice. We're not doing anything that's out of the ordinary here. This is a standard practice. It's just not something people who don't do it all the time are familiar with. Is that right? And the reason I bring this to you um, is kind of similar to the uh, it's the per perception of it. So how which way do you think that people would feel most safe? Because it's important that they feel safe in order to use the feel use the facility. Um, so that's that's what I'm trying to gauge right now. Right, uh, Steve. The only way that they would really feel safe would be if someone is watching live screen TV at a dispatcher somewhere and could call for uh, law enforcement to go there if there's an incident happening right then. Otherwise, the camera is recording somebody being beat up or that you look at later and you see what happened, but it maybe wouldn't necessarily prevent it from happening or making the person feel more secure. Ward? Steve, I think... <clears throat> People would feel most secure if there was actually a, Mike. a live person out there. That, if you want to go for the highest security, and um, that's probably also the highest cost. But as far as uh, having a sheriff uh, do a, a swing through there on a regular patrol, I think patrol, they do already. Uh, I think that that would be helpful. And I think again, like Dory suggests, uh, get the sheriff's office involved in the conversation. John, it, 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 oh, sorry. The cameras are just enforcement or to uh, for prosecution Parker. afterwards. They're evidence. Yeah. Right. So at Ruby Park, we have a lot of cameras, and I'm glad we do, and they get used a lot. Unfortunately, there's strange things that happen late night out there, uh, and we had to add uh, physical security. Um, around there as well. So we have uh, a security company that Rafty uses as well on their buses right. to be there as well as the cameras. So, um, and I want to come back to the point you, we did have a lot of campers and a lot of homeless and had some incidents. The sheriff did come in and, and talk to them and moved a lot of them out. So that, that has gone down quite a bit, but it still exists mm -hmm. out there. And uh, at one point, we had people call us up, telling them they weren't going to park or take the bus anymore out there when it was really bad because of all the things going on. So you're kind of at a remote out there, 2 a.m., mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so security, I think, is really going to be important for the lot to get used. Uh, somebody coming off of the job at a restaurant early in the morning or in the late at night, and it's just the extent. Um, and, and, ta and RAFTA ties into RAFTA's system all the way up and down the valley, all the park and rides and Ruby Park. That, this could be a really big camera system that would have a lot of impact. So I don't know, it's something to think about. But security is really key. And unfortunately, you, you don't think you should have to have that much. But to 
protect the facility and the users of the space you, you really got to commit to it it turns out we do i know at our our most recent raft uh, board meeting uh -huh. it was discussed that uh, our the drivers really are experiencing episodes almost every night mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. and uh, it's an issue so it's not the sort of thing happily most citizens don't have to think about it because it's taken care of by systems like this mm. I think GRS. Okay. I just had a question oh, yeah. on the staff recommendation. It talks about connecting it to Rafta's existing network. Mm -hmm. Is that what happens at Ruby Park? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's Great. all one yes. yeah. system. Uh, we're never going to get through this meeting. Right now, we're not going to get done here. Sorry. I, I, okay, my we name is Jeff Fielding. Moving, I'm the county engineer. I can speak towards this a little bit as well. Uh, actually, previous iterations of the EOTC have funded security cameras, uh, both at the ABC underpass, which is tied into the RAFTA system, and at uh, the Basalt underpass, we put in uh, cameras that are tied into the RAFTA system. Uh, uh, technologically, it might be a little bit more difficult here because there's not conduit run already, but uh, uh, running those uh, security cameras is, uh, is something that has uh, is something that we've heard in all of the different public processes for all of the projects that we've that we've had of this type, or that's something that people have requested. Great. Right. Thanks, Gr. I'll make the motion. Please do. I'll make the motion to consider the use of cameras. Where? Throughout <laughs> the restroom <laughs> platform and the feasibility. Oops. And consulting and, and we'll bring in the whatever it says in this well, recommendation. Yes, but I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I With mean, this security, this is a suggestion coming from staff. Right. But I think the way we're talking here, we think that the, at the very least we need to get the opinion of law enforcement. I just said we're okay. going to bring in the sheriff and ask. We him. need to bring in law enforcement. Okay. But it seemed to me that the discussion really was about putting cameras throughout the, yeah. throughout the parking. I mean, you know, yes, things could, can happen in, you know, in the platform. But that's where the, probably the best lighting is and the most people. And if, you, if you're a bad actor and you're looking to do something bad, you're going to try to do it that's correct. Where, where there right. aren't people. Well, I feel like the motion is to have them investigate what the appropriate security would be and combine with sheriff and other people that might have good information. You know, whether or not it's a live person between 10 and 2 in the morning or something right. else, whatever. Do we need a second and then amend the second? And have the discussion. I, I want to get a second. I'll on second this. the motion. Okay. Now yeah, for the same motion. All right. Uh, further discussion on. Well, now I'm not sure what the motion is. <laughs> well, the motion is to further investigate the appropriate security measures for the intercept lot, in combination with the sheriff's department and RAFTA and other people that are players in this game. Are we approving this staff recommendation to and, and amending that? <laughs> yes. We're basically expanding that recommendation yeah. Yeah. for them to really delve well, this into this. It's very security. clear, and I think we should vote on it. Okay. I have some discussion. <laughs> That's okay. Just with my experience in designing security systems for elections, it always starts out with kind of a bigger scope, and then, wow, that's expensive. How do we really get? to what we think is important. So um, in addition to working with the sheriff's office, I think it would be probably most efficient to come back with one or two or three different options with a price tag associated with it, because those costs climb up really quickly. All oh, in, I'm can sorry. I, uh, can I call this? Or All in favor? Yeah. Yeah. Aye. 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 Okay, Would thank you. you. Point well taken. Aye. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Alyssa. So how are you going to get us through the next five items Alyssa. in a half an hour? That's your challenge. <laughs> All right. Boy, pressure's on. I thought I was doing great. <laughs> um, the rest of us um, doing it up for you. Landscaping, let me just tell you real quick. Um, there is no landscaping plan yet. Uh, the main <laughs> item. That should be, okay. that should be the end. That's perfect. I'll make a motion. So, you know, we are looking at landscaping in the back of the lot to help buffer adjacent property owners. Um, we do have some easement concerns on the on this area that has been requested because there's underground power lines uh, with Holy Cross and we can't plan on top. So um, that's why you're not seeing any over there. So I want to make you aware of that. Um, and then the bike path connection, we are looking at continuing this um, down through 
uh, between the uh, the restroom facilities and the, and the underground on one side. Yeah, so it would be a more intuitive connection, um, and hopefully it'll help can, uh, help uh, encourage uh, bicycle transit uh, use. Steve, on the bike path connection, I would love to see somehow that we have a connection to the airport business center along Shale Bluffs. <coughs> That'd be lovely. I actually have an idea. I'm going to go walk under there and look at it and see. It might be something a lower cost way we might be able to do something there. And I am aware of that. I, it is outside the scope here. Um, yeah. So what we have done is any connection would be over on the south that side. side yeah. So making sure we're not precluding yeah. anything. Over is that a question, Ward? No, I just, okay. you can go under the underpass and curve around to the right and get right on the, um, the shoulder. I've done it many times by yeah, It's scary. Uh, regarding the, de the, the, just the traffic on that bike, crossing through there, there's, there's not going to be uh, pedestrian bicycle incidents in that area of a bike path, is there? That we this could, could be a more congested area right here. Right. Um, in talking with uh, Picking County Open Space, uh, they suggested, and I think it's a good idea, um, to include signage that for people who are just looking to go through, uh, to include signage and sharrows to guide them through um, this area. And then we have a stub out um, back to the path over on the far side. Okay, just to, yeah. The one thing I'd add is, you know where the two access points are across the bus um, mm -hmm. bus loop. Right. In between those two points, there would be fencing similar to okay. what's out there today on the other side. So we're going to direct them. All right. They need so we don't have we're not pushing the bikes right through the, the shooting gallery of. Yeah. Yeah. Thank correct. you. Okay. We don't need a vote on that. No. All right. Um, and we've made it through all these. Dang. Are we ready for the dynamic message yes, sign? Yes, let's moving right along. Dynamic well, message sign is up this next. Will, this is a discussion. I thought it was going to be the This will take a couple minutes. <laughs> um, so as you know, just a little bit of background, uh, we are at 30% plans. We've done uh, initial outreach in combination with the FLAP grant with the adjacent <coughs> property owners. Um, at the uh, March EOTC, we did reallocate the construction funding to 2019. Uh, we did decide on the butterfly design uh, and the 18-foot eight, wide um, butterfly design sign. Uh, as well as the uh, the use of Brush Creek Park and Ride. So the next steps uh, at this point are to decide on the location, um, as which would then allow us to move forward to bid and permitting. Great. Let's, let's see it. Um, so just to, to fill you in on a few other items, um, we, do, we are still looking into the feasibility of the vehicle and bus travel time. We're hoping to have more details on that after it goes out to bid. Uh, we will need to enter into an IGA for the maintenance of the sign. Um, and based on preliminary engineering cost estimates, we are looking at a cost of about 570. Uh, we've got 450 bid or budgeted now. Um, so it is currently looking like we would need to come back um, to look for a little bit more money to make this happen. Uh, but we would have an exact number after we got bids back. So I wanted to make you aware of that. Uh, Rachel? Are there any processes to be able to apply for additional money from CDOT towards this one element? We have been in touch with CDOT, um, and answer. short answer is none that they've found, found or identified to us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Right, guys. Thank you. Guys. Guys. Keep us under budget. <laughs> um, you know, it was just uh, at the Municipal League meeting where they were talking about the new revenues that are going to CDOT. And it's not a huge amount split among so many. But um, I'm not sure when the next uh, TPR meeting is. That's usually George for Trish. Brian should know. And, and Brian. But, you know, let's just look for money if we can. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, we're talking about looking for money at the TPR meeting. Got it. <laughs> Get us the money, Brian. Okay, Business moving on. <laughs> uh, so as you know um, from the, the staff report, the staff recommendation for the location is uh, remains at one mile down valley from Brush Creek. Could you point uh, to that one? For me that is this one right here okay and then show us where the park and ride is just on the far uh, park left. and ride to orient you so we've got brush creek park and ride here and this is brush creek road uh this red uh area here uh this is the cozy point property uh so it runs the whole length uh right here we have smith hill way uh and then the staff recommended location and the alternate location at 2.2 miles down that makes uh, then we sense. have wildcat road right here um, so in your packet, you do have the full engineering analysis uh, for each of those locations. Uh, based on safety and usability, we do not recommend anything um, closer than one mile to the intersection. Got it. Um, so these questions? two have been the, 
two closest um, locations have been identified as being um, both safe um, and having appropriate visibility for oncoming traffic. Tori? You have the staff recommendation. Why, where did the alternate location come from? Why, is, why are we talking about it? So when I went back to, as a part of the, the March 21st meeting, I was tasked with going back to each of the jurisdictions with uh, visualizations of the 18 and 26 foot wide butterfly design, uh, as well as a message list for each sign so you could see the, how they were both impacted. Um, as a result of the meeting with the, the city of Aspen, um, it was identified that the, the view plane or view shed um, adjacent to Cozy Point could be impacted by this location. Um, so that is why this then came back because we, uh, we didn't provide um, both location options at the EOTC because we, due to utilization um, uh, or utility, we didn't feel as though this was an appropriate site. Um, so we felt as though we only had one real option in terms of location. So as I was looking at this, um, I was, you know, considering a one mile, two miles, 60 mile an hour traffic. So how does this sign work? Meaning you're driving along in one mile, you've got to make up your mind that you're going to take a left turn and get on the bus. Is, is, is that the impetus? I know that the messaging sign is going to is can change. It will have other messages as well, but it's overall purpose is to get traffic to turn into this lot. So special events I, primarily. So so I'm I'm just you know two miles is that the distance that you know again there are people that do this for a living. There are studies that tell you how these signs actually function. So that's where I come at this question. I don't have a personal preference, but I would think that there is kind of a standard about lead time right. for turning. Good point. This, the standard um, on highways is one mile. Okay. Um, so after, um, after the conversation I uh, was with the city of Aspen on Tuesday, uh, that exact idea was brought up. I did do some research since then. I wasn't able to find anything that said um, percentage-wise that so far is you get so far away and you know, it diminishes by so much. Um, not to say that it doesn't exist, uh, but what I was able to identify, and part of the guidance here um, was CDOT um, and their recommendation that any uh, dynamic message sign should be placed about one mile from the decision point. So if you're driving down the interstate, most of those signs are about one mile prior. Um, I did look also look into California, New York, and Michigan. They were also one mile. Yeah, they're all one mile. Um, yeah. At, at all rates of speed, at all velocities? Yeah. Even 75 miles an hour. Well, 75. You know, <laughs> these, these were based on limited we've access spent a, We've spent some considerable time in Snowmass Town Council talking about the DMS sign, and we've all driven it. Um, <coughs> that whole part of the highway, as I'm sure uh, Steve has quite frequently. 2.2 miles, you even forget mm -hmm. what you're looking at. I did it again yesterday, and I'm going, my God. <laughs> Yeah. Just, where am I supposed to go? I I supposed to go? Why is it here? It makes no sense. The uh, one mile and it's perfect. It, it does. Be, it might be an age thing. I don't oh, know. stop. <laughs> <laughs> Love uh, each other. No, but uh, a, the one yeah. mile, the one mile, and looking at it, it does not block Cozy Point. Mm -hmm. And I have something to add to that real quick. Thanks to George Newman, he realized that there's two HOV signs right back to back on that section. So we're going to look at maybe removing one of them so it's going to declutter that section. That would be helpful. We have one yeah. HOV sign that we know, we know people pay such good attention to. And then we have this 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 dynamic message sign, which I think is appropriately placed. Yeah. Right um, Rachel and then Steve. Yeah, um, I'm OK with it being in the one mile zone. Mm -hmm. I really have a question about the visual here with the other little teeny squares that are right next to the one were those other no, no you know Signs. on the road oh, were those these. other considered locations and eliminated or something no that is distance from the sign so that's when you're approaching it that's how far it is okay um, so that's an analysis because the um, only thing i was thinking a little bit is if that moved back to one or two of those squares but again the general zone because it's so close to Smith Hill Road intersection and you know you got someone distracted by reading the sign and looking at it and then we've already had traffic accidents there we have cross traffic coming up and so I was just thinking that if it's a little further back from that first circle uh, maybe the second one back or something it might be just a little safer but that you know small small around the edges um, 
David, did you consider that? Do you want to add anything to that? It's a, I think it's a good point she's made, and it, you know, we're 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 thinking it's a mile from Brush Creek, but it's only 250 yards from Smith Hill Smith intersection. Hill Road. And people entering, and that's the most dangerous intersection right. in the county. We almost and had that, to signalize it before. That has been considered, and that was the reason why uh, this area over here is considered unsafe. Right. Um, right. Is because at this, if you place it on this side. Yeah, I'm not saying on that side. I'm yeah. saying use one of the two so little square distance squares back. Towards. Yeah, one of those two, so it's a little further back right. from Smith Hill. But then you have a concern about sight distance. There's yeah, you've got sight distance. Um, that and uh, yeah, I'll okay. just say it's sight, sight distance. Okay, so it has to be there. So okay, right answers that question. Uh, come on down. Uh, Chris Perry with Pitt County Public Works. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Chris. Yeah, as I can speak to that point, yeah, we can um, look into uh, moving the sign probably one, two, three hundred feet down and still keep our, our required sight distances for visibility and legibility. Yeah. So that shouldn't be something we consider. Uh, we actually have to pick the location to, to minimize any impacts, any utilities, any uh, uh, roadway infrastructure like culverts or anything like that. And there's actually a, um, an entrance to the Cozy Point access that we picked our exact location right now that we're showing at the 30 percent design plans just to um, be able to fit our guide rail, which is required at the uh, DMS sign, so we can fit within that. Uh, so it requires that a, impacting a, that, a guard rail that on access. the highway. So we just have to uh, make sure that we evaluate where right. our guard rail can fit within our location that we want. Right. Okay, but if it's possible to move it 100 or 200 feet and still hit all the criteria, we can go with it, but it's in generally it's about a mile away. Okay, I, I, I think that'd be great. 100 or 200 feet is really okay. about two seconds, okay. just so you know. Um, yeah. So, I mean, this sign is, is very difficult for me. Um, I'm sure you guys have all dealt with that as well from an aesthetic perspective. Um, it just continues that sort of urbanization, homogenization of our valley, which I frankly hate. Um, but uh, what also contributes to that is traffic. So if it's actually getting cars off the road, I could find it worth it. And so that's what Dave was mentioning. I asked that question at the last meeting was, do we have any hard data to show us that if we put this up, X amount of traffic, it'll be an estimate, we'll get off the road. And while I appreciate that this is the optimum spot, have we any uh, uh, test cases that demonstrate that this will actually get cars off the road? The data I was able to find um, said that the most effective way to get cars off the road is to give them travel times. Um, and that's the way you can get them to change course. Um, so, and that's what, that's clearly what showed up in our survey as well. Um, and that's technology that we're looking at. Um, that's why I brought up that we don't have, we're still evaluating the technology available to measure the, the travel time between a bus and a car because we're not looking to divert people to say Smith Hill way we want them to get on the bus right. um, so that that's a piece that we're still um, looking into mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that we're gonna have good solid answers until we get bids back right. but presumably there's a future where the sign says park and ride left bus 14 minutes traffic 53 minutes exactly that's what we're shooting right. for um, can I is there I don't know how this proceeds but um, mm -hmm. Could I vote yes on this? But you know, is there a second chance for me to say no if we're not going to go? You can make that? a motion. <laughs> I, I would say it's it's likely you you'll a get motion. a second chance because the bid will probably come in higher than the 450. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. uh, um, in which case, we would have to come back and, and discuss yeah. funding. Uh, okay. And I also just want to sure, Kelly. Um, mention too to consider other value that the sign could bring for evacuations yeah, yeah, and special event information and closures of ski parking and all that kind of stuff um, too should this technology not come to bear and the timing that we might want you know weighing those other values in this decision thank you Kelly Steve um, the people who know who come every day on the highway they might be anticipating going on Smith Hill Way or turning left into the park at the Brush Creek. They're going to be in the left lane anticipating. They want to see what, what the traffic, what the sign says about the traffic, what's the delay, and then they would make their decision. How are they going to get into town? Are they going to turn left? Or are they going to be going to Brush Creek? It should be in the left lane already at that point because if it's heavy traffic, it might take you a whole mile to get 
moved over into the left lane. So that just I like, thinking what are people gonna do in reality when the sign is there? And how those those who will probably be using it the most. We'll use it on ski Saturdays. It, it is possible, yes. Um, and like I said, that's that's one of the you know, placing it over here, we might be able to avoid some of that, but then we run into safety issues. Um, but I, I'm not going that I'm not sure on a on a good way to totally avoid that situation. Right. Do you have a motion on the table yet? Uh, we don't I don't think we even need a motion here, do we? Do we need a motion to approve yeah. this? Yeah. This one? I, we do. Like we do. Here. Okay. All right. Is what I mean. I didn't see an asterisk. You threw me off. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, the alternate location was picked for a reason, and I, I'm sure you've all gone through this. So we're kind of reinventing the wheel. I don't want to undo <coughs> what you've spent the time you've spent on this. Um, I and I, you know, I, the alternate location was starting to look good to me. And I don't know if anyone else agrees, but you know, what's wrong with putting it that far down? I know we're going to have some other fixed signs that are in for, you know reinforce whatever the message is uh, between there and and the inner and the and the lot brush creek lot so tell us what was the op what was the option regarding the alternate location and additional signage we're going to remove an hov sign or two but we might add a fixed sign that reminds people to take a left at the park and ride uh, yeah so what we um had discussed uh, back in March uh, was putting a, a static sign somewhere in this area that just says Brush Creek Park and Ride left. Um, so that if you pass this sign and you say you have a message on there that says free bus Brush Creek Park and Ride, people are like, I don't know what that is. Um, then you've got a directional sign over on this a little bit farther down. Right. Okay. Ward? I think most of the people that are going to be using this are familiar with that road, and after they see the sign there once or twice, uh, that they'll be looking at what the traffic times are, and they'll make up their mind. And I don't think that it's it's particularly going to uh, get the first time user, first time driver coming into town. So I, 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 I guess I'm going with the staff recommendation. I would go with that. I think Martin. one of the things we need to be very mindful of of this sign is messaging uh, skier traffic. This winter, I don't know how many times all of the lots were filled with snow ma in snow mass, and people would come up to snow mass to only have to go back down to Brush Creek. And if they knew that our parking lots, the free parking <coughs> lots are filled, they're going to turn left. So it may not be the first time user. It could be a lot of people coming up Valley to ski. And then the second part of it is there are a lot more special events going on, particularly in snow mass, in case people don't know what's going on in <laughs> snow mass. So those special events, we need to get them out of the rodeo lot or town park station because those are starting to overflow. Mm -hmm. So that, the point of this is I think it's perfect, and I think it's perfectly placed. Okay. Rachel? I just think we would put the message on the message board, as you saying, Marky, and when you say parking in Aspen, $6 an hour, turn left, free parking, <laughs> it's going to make a difference. I think that's great. <laughs> we, uh, I'd, I'd like to oh, go ahead. Just, yeah, just one more um, suggestion, whoever's going to make a motion. Um, I'd like to uh, suggest that we do a bit of exploration on how we might sort of beautify the sign, describe it, make it unique, be it, you know, a wrap or some kind of concealment, um, but make <laughs> it look base. a bit different than it would uh, over I-25 would We're be awesome. wrap it with a scenic picture of Cozy Point. Well, yeah, or, or the mountains in the background. I mean, honestly, so, yeah. Stone, yeah, yeah, a base, so a, like that a plinth or something. Yeah. I don't know what's possible. The, the standard um, is, to, is to paint it mm -hmm. so that it's not just a steel. Um, outside that, I would... We would have to run it by CDOT. It would be part of their permitting as to what they would allow or not allow. See what, uh, what would be possible. Yeah. Uh, 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 back back to yeah. Marky. Okay, I move that we move forward with a dynamic messaging sign following staff recommendation regarding location. I will second that. And we have a second further discussion. Uh, I just want further discussion for me is wildlife's a big concern. This is an elk carnage area. One guy took out, hit five elk in one crash this winter killed three on the spot you know this is a place where that sign could really help save the lives of a lot of elk yeah. um, are they going to read it 
They'll see it. <laughs> but you have to put it where they can <laughs> see it. They can cross where the sign says Yeah. Yes. Very fast. No. <laughs> this is what I have to work with. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you. Thank you so <laughs> much. Uh, okay, now we still had a couple more. made it to my visualization. We had a couple more things to do. We've got another half hour probably, so Mark, you may miss the uh, opening act. Well, we'll all miss it because we all go to the That's Thursday right. night concerts. Who's up? Who's on tonight? Uh, Whitaker. Let's keep moving. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to get back up to my, because the <laughs> retreat, the retreat oh, uh, got, me, got placed <laughs> separately. Um, so if you if you recall from uh, the last uh, EOTC meeting, I sent out a doodle poll. We identified a date uh, for the retreat. Uh, that date has been set for August 7th from 8.15 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Aspen Meadow Resorts. Um, the goals of the retreat uh, is first to establish a baseline of understanding of the EOTC purpose, requirements, structure, finding, or funding, uh, and operations. Uh, the next is to identify the strengths, opportunities, and challenges facing the EOTC today. Uh, and the third uh, is to create a priority list of themes, major topics, uh, and projects to help guide the EOTC's next steps. So that's really anticipated to be the, the product uh, at this point. Um, and the, the uh, compilation of the, of the priority list, I think, can be anything um, from governance to um, priorities in terms of transit or um, what have you. So the goal, um, it's been about five years since you've had a retreat. Uh, you now have me on board, so you have a resource that you, you didn't have before. Um, and so from my perspective, I want to make sure that I'm spending my time wisely and doing, working on projects that you all um, find are, are useful and um, valuable for, um, for me to be spending my time on. So I've got, I've got that self-interest, uh, but I also uh, believe that because of the time that has passed, uh, it's time to re, uh, revisit this uh, the re strategic portion um, of the EOTC's pur purpose. Is there anything um, on this and, list that's missing that you? Um, I would just suggest that given um, today's meeting and how hard it is to get through things sometimes with three different bodies, that we go ahead and book it till four o'clock instead of three. Um, there's going to be good lengthy discussions. It's the first time in five or seven years, whatever. So that's my first comment. Um, the second is I, I want to make sure we are using the resources that we already have available for informing our discussion when we get into the identification of transportation projects and themes. Um, particularly the city did a lot of work with its concept of mobility lab and shift and um, that did not go forward but there were elements that were really valuable. And so I, I think we should have um, that on the table as we're discussing it, you know, more of the should there be specific shuttles that go to Red Mountain and don't just drop people at Ruby Park. That was a fairly decent idea to capture some people, but it fell off when the whole project fell off. So I don't want us to have to sit there re-brainstorming, well, maybe we could try this and maybe we could try that, drawing from any of the older documents or efforts that we've made in the past. Um, and the second thing is we have either at this or, or coming from this, uh, how do we measure the bang for the buck as we go forward with projects and, uh, you know, talk about a matrix or how we will make decisions because we'll have far more projects on the list than we can afford or do in a short fashion. Uh, but how do we set outcome expectations, whether it's like expectations for the effectiveness of the message sign or anything else we do. So those are kind of components to me of what uh, a retreat should at least identify going forward. I don't know that we have to spend a lot of time on it, but h how do we sort through those, those many uh, transportation projects and themes? And how do we start to measure bang for buck and um, place uh, outcome goals on them? I think, yeah, it doesn't have to yeah. be answered now. That's just my input to a retreat. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that, that is good feedback. The intent isn't to end up with a list of infrastructure projects. Um, it's intended to end up with a list of major themes to be working towards um, and major areas that we need to be It'll working on. It'll bleed into projects. It, 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 will end, it could very well have projects on it, and it could very well start with projects and end up in themes. Yeah. Um, so I think that there's the discussions could go all over the place, as you said. Um, 
to look at the the agenda and just walk you through um, what we're anticipating. And I, t I apologize, Stephanie Zazo was supposed to be here tonight, but she had a death in the family and wasn't uh, able to make it last minute. Um, so we're looking at uh, the morning um, going through EOTC basics. So that would be me uh, doing a presentation on basically the, the history of the EOTC, uh, where it's coming from, the successes that it's had. Uh, the EOTC has had great success over the years. Um, and really building that toward of uh, sort of uh, environmental scan and background uh, for you to then move into a SWOT or SOC analysis. Um, so this is, this is where all of those ideas get thrown out um, in terms of what's, what are the EOTC's um, strengths, opportunities, and challenges. Um, and then the afternoon uh, would be then distilling those uh, into, the, into manageable uh, themes and focus areas. Um, so that, and then prioritizing those themes and focus areas. Uh, so is, is the governance of the EOTC, is that something that we really need to focus on right away? Or is it, um, is it something else? You know, is it something operations related? Is it infrastructure related? Where, where should we be placing our attention and our energy uh, to make sure that this group um, not only functions efficiently and effectively, uh, but that we're also getting to the ends that you want to be getting to? Um, so that's, I don't necessarily see this as we're going to have one retreat, we're going to solve it, we're going to be done. Uh, this, I see this as really we're going to be let, uh, setting out the next steps. Where do we want to go from there and how do we continue to achieve uh, what we want to achieve? Uh, so that's my vision. Follow up yeah. on that. Um, I think that sounds great. I really look forward to it and I'm glad you're on board helping us organize. Um, the one thing I would ask that we try to do is prepare beforehand a memo yeah. for us all that is a where we are at now. You know, this group was essentially the genesis of the Regional Transportation mm -hmm. Authority right. uh, and, and started the initial funding. But from when we started in 93 to what we've accomplished thus far, but also, you know, and the RAFTA board members obviously are totally up to speed. I'm not sure the rest of us are mm -hmm. of what we're going to be seeing in terms of benefits from the increased services and what RAFTA is doing. So I think just, again, it doesn't have to go over it at the retreat, but a memo beforehand of where are we now? What, how many people? are we moving? How, where are they parking? What do we got? How many parking spaces do we have in Snowmass Aspen? You know, just a, a baseline no. that can guide our conversations. And that's a, a, a packet in advance, clearly enough prep so we come prepared for this. Right, so we can have read through it and, and our questions right. are answered and maybe we can we save some time. Really get way. some some raft of presentation in there. Uh, I wanted to say pretty much the same thing, but I wanted to also add that we're we're working on an airport visioning plan, which is still out there uh, with our, our various committees. Uh, multimodal transportation, uh, it seems that the airport ought to connect to the bus somehow and the other transportation solutions. So that should be part of the conversation, and I'm not sure what we'd get in the way of a presentation, or, but I think it has to be. Well, yeah, yeah but it should it not be but part of this retreat. But Greg, just, I think that, I think that the transportation issue of connectivity to the airport is not part of the airport vision. Right. It, it, it RAFTA is sort of taking that separately. I, I, I believe you're right. I'm concerned that it's not part of the vision. John. John's coming up to talk to us. It is part of the vision. <laughs> um, oh, okay then. Yeah, and so the, um, you know, it, again, as a vision statement, it won't be at the design level necessarily, but we are um, asking, you know, uh, about um, all aspects of the experience at the airport, and that does include <coughs> connectivity uh, to the to the community. We are certainly not there yet. The EA um, that was approved mm -hmm. did include um, both uh, transportation corridors, the existing rail corridor as well as transit connectivity um, from the airport <coughs> to, the, to the community. So it is part of the overall scope. I would encourage that that is probably a more detailed and, and broader uh, discussion that we'll be able to bring back, but we do recognize the importance of the airport as a uh, transit link. I wanted, I wanted to add what I think Rachel's one who suggested we go till four. You know, this is a body that meets eight hours a year, as one of our members pointed out. You know, if this retreat is needed, needs to go till five that day, I'm good with it. You know, I'd like to, I'd like to have time to really contemplate all this because this is the important work. 
and to, and to, you know, when the public finds out we have a retreat, but we didn't talk about something as, as important as that, it makes me a little nervous. Well, I think stretching it to five o'clock may exhaust our ability to think. That, that was our concern, Adding too. an additional hour makes better sense. Yeah, and we can end early if we can end early. I, I just wanted to make sure we had booked enough yeah, time. Yeah, just make sure we have the time to get it all in. Greg, perhaps on, on your question on the airport to John, it, it's more maybe we just need the factoids of how many parking spaces are they looking at? Because the airport will have either huge expense building those parking spaces or parking spaces underground or whatever, or it's going to connect well with transit and then uh, need less parking spaces. And so, uh, again, if, if we even have some ideas of what they're looking at with traffic generation or, or those numbers to look at in the, in the retreat, but not the whole plan. Yeah, and we, we may or may not be that far along in the visioning process. We can certainly provide um, what was approved in the environmental assessment. I do think in the visioning process there's still a conversation ongoing about employments and growth and and those sorts of things that the committees um, some a couple of you are on those committees are going to be considering over the next uh, several meetings over the next few months so we will provide okay. what we the most with. updated information it may be what's in the ea right now okay okay great point taken this is probably for an airport meeting and not right now, but since I got gotcha, you, I got gotcha. you. Um, hey, is there any studies, data, surveys that have been done with folks that are arriving in Aspen, knowing where people that are getting off of airplanes, how they're traveling to their final destination, what their de destinations are? Is, is that information? We, we have some of that in the EA. I, I would not... Um, I, I wouldn't... I, I don't know how accurate it is... Um, frankly, for, for how fo most folks are traveling either by um, shuttle or, or car. I, I, there is not a lot of uh, transit uptake on the airport right now. I, I would suggest, car. Um, you know, knowing that everybody that flies into Aspen comes through the same exact doorway, mm -hmm. you have a great opportunity to really ask a question of people that are visiting us. And I think Rachel makes a good point about, you know, what the demands are going to be and at the airport are going to be determined by what systems the airport puts in and there's a lot of new things that have been talked about and so I think having those that kind of information from the visitors would be a great thing and I think you know you you've got a captive audience on an airplane coming in so mm -hmm. and that, a simple survey on an airplane would be great yep. good good point let's note it Probably not this. for necessarily this retreat, but we can do it as part right, of the airport right. planning project. Sorry, all right. The next retreat we can discuss that will be a full year later, <laughs> I assume. So just keeping that in mind. <laughs> um, okay. What? Anybody? Anything else? Let's keep it going. That was everything I had on the retreat. I uh, just wanted to see, like, the the memo is a is a great idea. If you're receptive to that, I can certainly put that together and get that out. And to that you. is a great venue. So thank you. Okay. Put the extra hour in. If we can get the all written material in plenty of time to read ahead of time, um, just so we can hit the ground running gotcha. right from the get go on that. Okay, great. I can it's do that. Thanks, David. time when we can all be together. It's, it's make great. The most of it. Great to have you putting this together. And I'm sorry, yeah. Stephanie couldn't be here, understandably. Her credentials look really good she and really impressive. And maybe we send her a link to this so she can get a sense of the cast of characters she's going to be working with. She was very disappointed that she couldn't make it. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to scare her away, do we? Okay. okay, I want to keep this going. What's, give us what's next. I think next is... David Beckler. Wow, it's going to take me a while to get back through this presentation to get to your slide. This, uh, it's actually very short <laughs> and sweet. Um, the, we've just kind of completed a a public outreach process to get some input on a co very conceptual design pre-sketch, if you will, mm -hmm. if you understand sketch, primary, and final mm -hmm. land use planning. Um, what you see there is a, a image of the existing Rafta Depot. It was built uh, probably around 1972 when they finally found that Snowmelt Road being a straight road from top to bottom became a luge run and they had to put a kink in it just to slow everybody down. <laughs> so um, what we're dealing with is a very aged and dated structure. Um, we've been working with Rafta, we've been working with the uh, adjacent property owner, we've been working with um, the mall merchants themselves. Uh, but 
In a lot of ways, this is a three-dimensional puzzle. The site is very challenging. It's constrained by uh, topography and um, development on one side and a creek on the other side. Um, the demands here are <coughs> significant. A major goal for the community has been to try and get give transit a priority as the means of mobility between our our uh, community, the city of Aspen, and our labor force down Valley. One of those main objectives is to put the transit facility on the mall grade at the center of what is the community of Snowmass, or its historic center. Um, one of the challenges in doing this has been the MCI bus, the 45-foot raft of bus. We're trying to design to the lowest co common denominator. So that has been a real challenge to make sure that we can fit the four bays that RAFTA is looking for that can be op fully operational and independently functional. Um, that's been a big challenge. Um, we're trying to accommodate our local system here with RAFTA. Uh, it sounds trivial, but it is a major impact to the regional system is that once we made it free from Aspen to Snowmass, now RAFTA is carrying local trips, uh, which are occupying regional seats. And that's a big impact on the regional service in the peak hour. When you get to Base Village, the bus is full. He can't pick up the other stops going out of town. And then they get to an employee housing complex down by Town Park Station, and 12 people get off the bus. And now you've got mm -hmm. empty seats. So one, that's one of these goals is to bring both systems together so that we truly try to sif siphon off local trips back onto the local shuttle and free up more capacity on the regional shuttle. I wish I had some images to give you, but we're still in a process. We just finished with Council's uh, look at the project. Um, and before, and we're planning to go to the Planning Commission very soon here in July. Uh, to give them a look at it once we get community buy-in to what this design can be and, and look like and is acceptable to the community then we're going to bring do a, a value engineering study to get a, a cost price for what the projects could theoretically run so again we're very uh, preliminary um, we have achieved a lot of goals that we set for the program we are trying to stay within uh, the dollars allowed, some $7 million is what we're trying to use as a uh, target for the project budget. Um, I know it's late. That's a lot of information. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. I have one quick question. I think it would be great after all the years of hearing about Snowmass Transit Station to actually have you guys get one. <laughs> I've been working on it since 83, so I'm with you all the way. I've been hearing about it since 98, so I'm, I'm, you're way ahead of me. But I think it would be great. I think this is a good start again. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Okay, Dave's done. David Johnson. Thank you. Dave. This is David Day today. It's Usually some, it's John Day. Something with Day. transportation it's John and Day. David. Dave, David, David. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. I feel so special until Marky came up and said, make this quick. Right, yeah. So uh, I, I will. Marky, you can take your time. Saving the best for last. Familiar with you got 22 minutes. <laughs> Love you, Dave. You must get to the gun. You got all your slides, huh? Oh. Okay. okay. Uh, do I just press something? The okay. Next. Got it. Okay. Um, so November 2018, we, we successfully passed the, the uh, Destination 2040 ballot measure, 7A, for uh, 2.65 mil property tax. Um, a lot of that is coming from your communities, so thank you. Um, it, was only, it was one of only two such measures in the, in the entire state that passed in November. So Yay. thank you especially. Rafta. Thank you. Well, well, it took a lot of heavy lifting, right, Greg? It was a lot yeah. of work. I appreciate everyone that did that. Well, we appreciate that, and we thought, well, maybe we better report back to you often uh, on how this, on how it's going with all these projects. I think there are about 25 projects that, mm -hmm. programs and projects that we said that we were going to implement, and not all of them. I'm not showing all of them. I'm showing the ones that that are either in Pitkin County or are generally of, of interest to, to to the EOTC. Hopefully, uh, so I'll just cruise through through these slides. Um, to give you a progress report on uh, on these. First of all, bus replacement. I think the day after uh, we we realized that we uh, that we this initiative was successful, we 
bought 10 new buses. Um, we, we really needed new buses. I'm, I, I'm, when I'm out and about right now on the bus or wherever, I, I still see some of the relics that need to get off the road. So uh, they'll be coming uh, in, in December of 2019. Uh, but don't worry if you like any of those old buses, we'll be keeping them for XKs probably. And, and then when they can't run, we'll part them out and then maybe they'll end up in someone's front yard. Oh, awesome. Tiny house. <laughs> yeah. uh, battery electric buses. Um, we are also repla uh, replacing eight buses with, with eight battery electrics, and they will be operating primarily uh, within the city of Aspen. Um, for one, because at, because uh, the, the the local governments around here uh, provided a lot of the funding, and also because we need to keep these buses near the mothership to get them charged to make sure that w this is a pilot program. We we got to make sure these things run, so we want to keep them close to an energy Dave, can source. I ask a question yep. on uh, electric. I remember one of the issues that really drove us toward electric was um, Highlands and and diesel fumes at Highlands being a problem with all the buses cycling through there. Are, are the electrics going to help relieve some of that? Uh, I, I believe uh, we, we, we've been looking at a number of, of different routes, and I believe Highlands is on there. And if it's not, it's because we're, we're, we're probably scared of taking it that far. Um, Agreed. But that doesn't mean that's just because we're, we're trying to be extra ultra conservative in how we okay. run these things, we'll just for the first. And see how it works. Yeah. Okay. Yep. okay. Great. I get Thanks. my neighborhood first. <laughs> no, uh, my neighborhood. Yeah, right. Okay, uh, Rio Grande. Okay. Yeah, next one, uh, Rio, Rio Grande. We replaced some, some bridge decks and substructure repairs at uh, Roaring Fork, Emma, and, Win and Wingo Bridges, and we're also doing some, some asphalt repair. That's going to be going on and on every year on the trail. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, we, we committed to doing five or six service improvements. We're starting all, all of those will be implemented within a year. Um, this one, 30-minute uh, valley service with enhanced snow mass service, that started April 22nd. Um, we now have weekend BRT and um, as part of that uh, Carbondale circulator service because that's kind of a, a must um, operationally. I won't get into that. Um, basically, now we ha we'll have BRT running 365 days a year. Uh, better transit service connections to Snowmass Snow Village. That actually started in, in 2018, but we said that if, that if this passed, we would take over the funding of that. And so we did. Uh, so improvements to the Mid Valley Highway 82 bus stations. Most of these are in Pitkin County. Uh, design uh, design of, of the priority needs at each each of these stations is going on, and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll make them happen uh, next year. None of these include giant eggs, right? They all do only at BRT stuff. stations. No way, really? Wait. Wait. How you know it's a really? for the Velociraptor? How you know it's a Velociraptor yeah. stop? No, and not a regular stop. local stop. Yeah. Oh. There's a purpose. I thought we were going to just quietly let that one die. Oh, okay. I like that. I love oh, these. I love them. The kids love them. Yeah. Okay. They're really fun. I mean, concerning the overall cost, is a $50 million <laughs> project. Not that big. Greg, I second that. For, for Remember, it's fast, fun, and frequent, and the eggs are part of the fat. They're part of the fat. Okay. Part of the fat. Part part of the fat. okay. I'm sorry I brought that up. Go ahead. Good times. Okay, um, improvements to the town of Snowmass Transit Center. Uh, we've been working with Snowmass, and yes, it's that. been a battle. You know, limited limited land, lots of expectations, limited budget, and then hey, bring it back Raft to comes the, along bring and it says back we want four We're stalls. We're going to separate so. you two over there. Anyway. Okay. Uh, okay, and what's the Aspen Maintenance Facility, uh, one of our key, still one of our key facilities. Um, uh, we are we have a number of improvements planned over the next five to ten years, but the biggest priority is replacing these fuel tanks. They're 30 years old. They're fine. We monitor them like crazy, but uh, they will be uh, replaced next year. Design is going on right now. Excellent. Can I ask Rachel? A, at the BAFTA maintenance facility here, um, when the buses are washed, is there an oil separator or anything for the water that eventually filters through down towards the Roaring Fork? I am not sure, but I'm going to say, you know, I can get back to you. I'm 99 percent sure that, that, that we do that. I, I couldn't okay. imagine. Okay. I, I, I just like to make sure, because I know we, we were looking at it when we redid our public works building, and I can't, um, we, did, we didn't get the extra money to do that, uh, unfortunately. But I, I just was wondering, as we're after improving and modernizing things like leaking fuel tanks, it'd be good to look for any other they're not leaking, carbon. But, but, well, or could yeah. potentially, yeah, <laughs> replacing them before yes, yes. they are leaking. Um, <laughs> And the second was, I just uh, really uh, am not clear because I had this head cold, but when you went back to the Enhanced Snowmass Village bus service, does that take out um, the EOTC dollar support 
so that continues to grow more as an EOTC fund? No. Or was that just increased service connecting, you know, I mean, I, I can't remember, we talked a lot about the free bus service potentially being taken over by RAFTA as they uh, expanded neighborhood service in other communities in the whole service area. But I, I just couldn't remember if it... And funding coming from the new ballot measure rather than funding right. coming from us. Right, and, and it did. Okay. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Well, that'll help pay for that transit. Do, any other questions? Uh, Did you want to bring up the Glenwood maintenance facility? Because there's work going on as a result of the 7A, and I think it's really important. Sure. Um, we are pursuing uh, a build grant again this year. Uh, mm -hmm. um, for we're, we're applying for $8 million. Uh, we've, had to, we've had to cut back. Um, build grant funding is, is so competitive. Last year we asked, we asked for $22 million um, because this facility, this whole facility uh, renovation and expansion is roughly $32 million. So one, um, we, we decided to cut it back and we are, we are applying for funding um, along with local funding to um, do one primary component and that is heated and closed storage for 60 buses. Um, as you buy new, you know, buses, whatever, t 20 years ago were just these kind of workhorse things. You know, Detroit diesels operated anywhere, kind of like your Ford, kind of like your pickup truck. Now they're kind of orchid children, and we're running CNGs. We're going to be running Computers. better electric buses. They have all sorts of components on them, so we want to keep them inside. And, keep, and, and um, we think that that will, um, that that's going to add to lo longevity and, and reduce maintenance. The only other thing you may want to talk about is the low material to help with our colleagues in Newcastle. Okay, yeah. Lova, um, the Lower Valley. Lower, Lower Valley, Valley Trails oh, Association has, has been, also probably since the 80s, has been working on uh, trying to um, uh, fund and construct a trail roughly between Glenwood Springs and actually probably all the way to the, eventually to um, even the state line, I think. Mm -hmm. um, As in Utah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, we'll though, the most Newcastle. critical and cha <laughs> challenging part, though, is just the 12 Glenwood miles Canyon. between Glenwood Springs and Newcastle. Right. Right. So uh, as, part of, as part of this ballot initiative, and again, we, we really had to ratch down the ballot initiative to make it pass. Um, we, we, had, we, we, could, we were authorized for up to five mills, and we ended up asking for 2.65, right. and we passed that by a 4% margin. So uh, we cut back on, on a lot of projects. So we, we have committed to $2 million to fund the Lova Trail. Um, and hopefully, but that won't, that won't get you 12 miles of Lova Trail in that challenging terrain. So, but it will, it will match a lot of grants and, and we are committed to working with, with those communities between Newcastle and Glenwood Springs, uh, to, to make that happen. If I could, we had our raft retreat, uh, was it a week ago or two weeks ago? Uh, very recently. Was, <coughs> were you not there? I was in Africa. Bob, 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 was, in Africa. Was, Bob was there. Um, it was a great retreat. A lot of wonderful things came up, a lot of interesting stuff. Um, I put in my two cents went worth in about how uh, we've been doing our mental health first aid trainings for Pitkin County. Uh, recently with Mind Springs, we've trained 26 new trainers and we're spreading them out in the community. I wouldn't, I know I encourage DRAFTA to take on a mental health first aid because their drivers are the first point of contact, those late night contacts with the, you know, with difficult situations. Um, so we're, hopefully we're going to move forward with that. But I want to encourage Snowmass and Aspen as well. Get your staffs trained. It's, it's easy. It's probably free or close to it. And it's, it's really important. So anyway, but Rafter, uh, Dan was very embraced that, and I'm so grateful that he did. I just want to make sure we keep that going, because uh, I, I know our public health director knows about it and is eager to get started. Great. That's great. Thanks for bringing that up, Greg. Uh, anything else? Do we need a motion? To, are we ready for a motion? I think you should make a marking. Marky you might want to make a, a motion. motion to adjourn at 6:19. Second. Second. All uh, further discussion. No, but thanks. Thanks. No, guys. thank you, Greg. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, David. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Good job. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, David. That's 19 minutes. We'll never get back. So wet. Both of you see there. Both of you gentlemen.